reasonably interested in promoting constitutional orders of such an avenue of action. So contrary to the arbitrary conception of constitution, Sarkilicha submits that there are fundamental requirements of content to which any constitution must adhere for it to be a true constitution. Now, constitutions the world over vary considerably, but our, in our written submission, you will find the work of Professor Kurs Malan, who reminds us of the essence of constitutionalism. He says that it is the proper structuring of political power in the pursuit of just, justice for the polity as a whole. And it rests on two critical foundations. The first is citizenship, the ability of, of, of participation on an independent and equal footing with other citizens in governing the polity. Uh, and second is a dispersal of power. If it wants to be more than a decree, a constitution has to structure a dispersal of power uh, broader even than the trias politica. The need for a dispersal of power is recognized widely by all modern day constitutional law scholars. And in the absence of a proper dispersal of power, we find the specter of absolutism, the unrestrained ability of governments and states to intervene um, without the checks from civil society. And any government, uh, any introduction of a power to expropriate without compensation on the, on the, on the side of the state uh, would be uh, incompatible with constitutionalism uh, itself. In fact, um, it detracts individually from the ability of one or more citizens to participate with his or her property, but without compensating them for that detraction, and that is to treat people as if they are criminals, as if the subject of our, of our investigation is asset forfeiture, and reassign that ownership to the state. So this detraction and treating uh, of, of confiscation as if it is, as, is asset forfeiture uh, is absolutely at odds with constitutionalism. My third point is that expropriation without compensation is confiscation. I've already used the term confiscation once, but the term expropriation without compensation has gained widespread use over these past three years. Legally speaking, it is more accurate to consider this as a case of confiscation. That is the type of legal action uh, relevant here. Now, it is true, as many have pointed out over these past three years, that expropriation is an accepted power of states. But without exception, this power is accompanied by the obligation of payment, usually not only for the market value of that property, but often also uh, of a solatium, that is an amount over and above market value as consolation for the loss of property. Expropriation, legally speaking, is therefore a concept that is always linked to a remedy in the form of payment for what a property is worth at a certain point in time. If we sever that connection between the the, the value of the property and the deed of expropriation, then we are talking decidedly not about expropriation, but confiscation. confiscation. And the term expropriation is, is therefore mistaken, as both Professor Kursmalan and Professor Henny Stradom uh, elaborates in our written submissions. Now it follows, and it is important to point out that insofar as any act of expropriation is with compensation, but below market value, Below market value, that shortfall also confiscate, con constitutes a confiscation, uh, albeit a partial one. This is not to say that there are not more or less desirable patterns of ownership and that matters of justice uh, do not necess necessitate reform. Uh, the answer, though, is to persist with a long and hard way, the main maintenance of a constitutional order and the rule of law, but just with more urgency and competency. And I can cite many examples but the existing land restitution program, um, free market land reform, providing title deeds for property owners um, where they were denied this before, but they already hold the, uh, the property in all that name, uh, the privatization of state land. These are all um, possible ways of uh, uh, addressing land reform without endangering the constitutional order itself. Now, fourth, uh, I want to speak about obfuscating confiscation with alternative terminology. And I want to suggest that we might be dealing with a public law legal fraud, uh, a case of fraus leges. Uh, in more recent times, certain participants in this debate and even the wording of the draft amendment bill jettisoned the word expropriation without compensation and replaced it with expropriation at nil compensation. Now, this change was apparently introduced as if it matters substantially, when in fact it has no substantially different consequences. That means that it is an attempt to pretend 
that expropriation without compensation does not exist in South Africa, when in fact that is precisely what is being introduced. And I draw in, in the next few paragraphs from the work of Mr. Martin von Stad and a legal fellow at Sarkalicha. Doing formally one thing when in substance an alternative is attempted is, fraudulent, is a fraudulent endeavor. Fraus legis, uh, defrauding or evading the application of law is a doctrine well known to students of private law, but its application within public law, including constitutional law, remains largely unconsidered. But I think that it is something this committee should consider. While the public and legal debate is generally concerned with expropriation without compensation, the bill's wording is for expropriation at nil compensation. And by, but by Parliament's own admission, this is a distinction without a difference. Compensation and expropriation are legally and conceptually married. And as a result, it would be impermissible to expropriate without compensation. Instead, nil compensation will be paid. But how does this current legal affair uh, comport with the substance of over with the substance of a form principle, and so Frau's legis now is at issue. The substance of nil compensation is expropriation without compensation, or as I pointed out earlier, confiscation. And attempting to conceal this fact in formality, and thereby attempting to evade the full inspection and constrictions of law and constitutionalism, it is submitted, is an instance whereby Parliament would be inviting action in fraudem legis. And where the Parliament considers it itself in, uh, in fraudem legis or in fraus legis is doubtful. But even if the Constitution uh, 18th Amendment Bill is adopted into law and Section 25 of the Constitution is amended, the courts must construe nil compensation for its substance, meaning no compensation whatsoever and have regard to whether such an arrangement satisfied the just and equitable standard set in section 25.3. The only difference, the only difference between expropriation without compensation and expropriation at mill compensation, since they are both instances of confiscation, are the incrimination of parliament for action uh, inviting infraudem legis. To, to conclude, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my recommendation to the committee and some public consequences we face uh, on the way forward. Uh, the state of affairs leaves Sarkalicha, business in general, and the public uh, in a, a sort of a predicament. We can never accept the proposed changes to the South African constitution, these changes. We can never accept them, no matter how many times they are adopted in parliament, no matter how well uh, they are formalistically and procedurally um, uh, followed through. Amending the constitution to facilitate confiscation would jeopardize the material basis on which citizenship and the dispersal of power, the two essential attributes of constitutionalism, rests. So should confiscation, regardless of whether it is called expropriation without compensation or expropriation at nil compensation, should that be written into the text of the constitution? It would trigger certain obligations on our part and I believe on the part of all bona fide actors in society. These uh, obligations flow from the fact that the text of the South African constitution has been changed in a way that delegitimizes the constitutional order insofar as those changes are given any effect. By nature of this change, we would be obligated by the requirements of constitutionalism itself. We would be obligated as would others uh, and also in the pursuit of a flourishing society to which we are committed to set in motion a sustained campaign to remedy the unconstitutionality of the South African constitution and restore constitutionality. It would be incumbent upon, upon all constitutionally minded people to put their full effort as never before behind the restoration of constitutionalism and in opposition to those who undermine constitutionalism. While ethically and morally necessary, it would lead to tension between the various communities in South Africa, regrettable and unnecessary and unaffordable tension, because the actions in defense of constitutionalism will be made suspect and attacked in racial terms. As a business organization, Sarkalicha will act to play the greatest role it possibly can to restore the foundations to order and prosperity in the country, as well as harmonious relationships between different communities. So this submission, Mr. Chairman, is one that focuses on substance and not on form. Sarkalicha submits that the constitution cannot be amended to facilitate confiscation as contemplated and remain a true constitution. 
it will lose its legitimacy insofar as it is so amended, and it will regain that only after such an amendment is undone. So I recommend to this committee that it reports to Parliament that it was unable to propose an amendment that makes explicit provision for confiscation because confiscation could never be implicit in the constitution proper and introducing it would produce an unconstitutional order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much for your eloquent amplification of your written uh, submission. I have no doubt that uh, that will assist the committee as it moves uh, forward. Uh, uh, can I just remind Advocate Ramano to help me keep the time? I hope you haven't exceeded the time. Uh, and then uh, we have 15 minutes for honorable members who want uh, any clarification. Uh, as I said, we are not dealing with the merits and demerits of your input. We just want clarity so that uh, you empower the members of parliament in dealing with this matter. I open the floor for hands. Okay. We have got uh, Mr. Shibambu, Mr. Gumede, Mr. Hendricks, and uh, Dr. Andlos. Gumede, and who? It's Shibambu. Shibambu. Gumede. Gumede. Hendricks. Hendricks. And Dr. Andlos. Dr. Andlos. Okay. <clears throat> uh, honorable members, let's say. Uh, Give the floor to Honorable Gumede. <clears throat> Honorable Gumede. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning to all members, yeah. as well as our presenter, Pete Leroux. Chair, uh, I wanted to ask. In fact, two questions, but uh, I'm hesitant to ask the one on confiscation. Uh, I don't want to misinterpret. Oh, okay. Firstly, let me say thank you for uh, your guidance that uh, we only ask the clarifications, but we are not debating because there will be quite a lot of elements for <coughs> in the presentation that we have just received. I just want to seek clarity from uh, Mr. Uh, LaRue that if he talks about the constitutionality of the Constitution of South Africa, is that in general or on this specific matter that we are talking about. Does he mean that as South Africans or as South Africa, we don't have a legitimate constitution in the whole country? Thank you, Chair. Let me wait there. Thank you, Honorable Gumede, for a clear and concise uh, question. Uh, Honorable Shbambo. Well, thank you, Chair. I, I, the speaker who just presented here, he says that you will never accept an amendment of the Constitution. Is he threatening us? Like, what kind of a presentation is that that says you're not going to accept the Constitution amendment? A democratic process, you're not going to accept majority rule. Ask a question. What, kind of, what, um, um, like there is a, what kind of nonsense is that? In terms oh, of what we're dealing with. Now, does this speaker who says he won't accept the constitutional amendment accept the fact that majority of the people who own the land currently got that land through colonial racist 
occupation of the land and dispossession of the black majority, do you accept that as a foundation first before you talk about confiscation? What is confiscation when what want to repossess our land? Like, what is the philosophical basis of, of, of characterizing the attainment of historical justice as confiscation? Confiscation, because all of you here, you Europeans, you came here not, not, not more than not, not so many years ago. <clears throat> You took our land, and now you are saying you're confiscating when you want to repossess Chairperson, our land. Where did that come Chairperson, from? Chairperson, uh, on a point of order. Yes, let's let's hear Honourable Shibambo. Let's hear the point of order. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I think this is totally unparliamentary that a presenter to Parliament is being insulted. We have to ask questions for clarification and not insult people. Dr. Lothrich, I actually don't understand what you mean by insult. Can you define that insult? What, what is it actually? If a person says something is nonsense, in my view, it means it has no sense. It, it's not necessarily an insult, but uh, uh, you know, help me understand your uh, it's, interpretation. It's not, of, it's not about no, the nonsense part, Chairperson. It is about mm -hmm. the fact that saying you Europeans came here and you did this and this. That is an insult, it is an assumption, and it is not parliamentary, and it is not in terms of our code of conduct as parliamentarians. On the pro Dr. Lothra, is it not a historical fact that uh, people of European descent at some point in our history came into the country. And that's why we also talk about the 1820 settlers, the arrival of Jan van Riebeck and other people. Are those not uh, historical facts? How do we then interpret them as insults? Can you help me understand? <clears throat> yes, do that chairperson. It is in the tone and manner. Uh, Honorable <laughs> Shivam, we started off by saying that the honorable presenter is threatening, which is also his own subjective view on, in this regard. But I do think there is a certain kind of decorum that we afford guests who present to parliament. Uh, Dr. Lotrich, uh, I want to agree with you that uh, we need a certain decorum. But I understood the honorable Shibambo to be to be asking whether we are being threatened. And that, I, in my view, does not violate uh, the decorum that we, we accept. But can I just also restate that all members of this committee have the right to express their opinion wrongly or rightly, but I agree with you that uh, the decorum must uh, be respected at all times, and I would request Honorable Shibambo to bear that in mind as he proceeds. Honorable Shibambo. <clears throat> no, thank you, Chair. The, uh, the questions are, 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 are straightforward. That what does it mean when he says that he's never going to abide by the constitutional amendment? Is he, is he disrespecting majority rule in, in South Africa? Because constitutionalism, amongst other things, talks about majority rule and the fact that you are permitted to amend the constitution as a parliament. And he says he will never accept it if he doesn't fit his values or if his organization is values. Uh, and and that, that is pure nonsensical in, in the manner that it is. And the, the issue is, does he accept that the majority of the current occupiers of land occupied it through colonial racist settlement, criminal settlement? Does he accept that philosophical foundation? Because you can only use the word of confiscation if you, you, you think that those who are occupying the land now are rightfully occupying the land in South Africa, and they, that is not the case. That is the question. Uh, I think that's straightforward. Chair. Let's deal with it. Let's listen to the threats. <clears throat> uh, honorable members, can I just uh, reiterate that all of you have the freedom of uh, opinion the freedom of expression. And that is uh, embodied in our constitution. So none of us should be offended by the expression of other 
uh, members uh, expression of uh, opinions uh, honorable uh, uh, gumed uh, honorable uh, hendricks uh, thank you very much uh, honorable chair honorable chair uh, i would like to know if the presenter has a quarrel with um, <coughs> Uh, confiscation or expropriation. Um, but as an alternative to that, will he accept repar reparations uh, 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 with a sanction? And I don't want to go into the motivation for that because Honorable Savambu expressed it uh, 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 very, very, very clearly. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Dr. Ndrozi. <clears throat> Thanks indeed, Chairperson. I apologize that I cannot switch my video on. Uh, I've got a network problem. Uh, if you will allow me to proceed. Uh, no, without... you, are clear. you are clear and uh, proceed. We are interested <clears throat> in the substance, not in the photo. Thank you. Uh, th Thanks indeed, Chairperson. I think that uh, <clears throat> It is important to provide the uh, presenter some important background. The stage at which we are at uh, is that the amendment is going to happen. So uh, the parliament has already adopted the idea that we must amend the constitution uh, to, to do expropriation. Uh, and therefore, anybody who does not accept a democratic outcome, whose very principle is majority rule, cannot uh, claim to be. <clears throat> but I'm interested to know that uh, just to punctuate the Honorable Shivambo's question of colonization, that colonization by definition was a criminal confiscation. If we accept that, that colonization was a legal confiscation of people's lands, through physical removal, violence, massacres, and all those things. That's the problem we are trying to resolve. Now, we are trying to resolve it through a democratic process of parliament, of courts, of laws, and in which we repossess the land. If he accepts that colonization was confiscation, how do we correct it without repossession? And then finally, what is the racial profile of your membership? You said you've got about 18,000 members of business. Could you just tell us quickly what is the racial profile uh, in percentage terms of, your, of the membership of your business society? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> honorable members, let's agree that uh, the purpose of this uh, hearing uh, to allow stakeholders to persuade parliament through this committee one way or the other. So uh, we <clears throat> should therefore not uh, take the view that uh, we are not going to allow the stakeholders to persuade parliament through our committee one way or the other because this is a process at the end, we will have to, parliament will have to determine whether or not it has been swayed one way or the other. But thank you, Honorable Dr. Nglossi for your questions and all the other members for their questions. And then uh, unless there's another hand, I will uh, ask uh, <clears throat> Mr. LaRue to respond to the legitimate questions that have been put to him. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Macheka. Uh, let me start by um, saying that the first speaker, uh, Mr. Gumede, asked whether uh, we, the, the, the concern here is, is on constitutionality is general or specific. The argument here, which we substantiate in our written submissions, is that a constitution is not any document simply because it was voted on but a document that has to conform to certain basic uh, parts or basic structures. It has to, as I said, have, to have a certain nature, otherwise it would not be legitimate. And what we are proposing is that 
introducing confiscation or by any other word or other term into the constitution would detract from the legitimacy of the constitution. So this is not, an, uh, an, uh, the, my presentation is, uh, as nothing uh, uh, does not uh, incriminate the constitution. It says that we risk uh, de detracting from the legitimacy of the constitution if we insert into it something that is fundamentally at odds with the nature of constitutionalism. <coughs> then um, we also had the question on whether um, uh, whether this um, whether, whether it is. It seems that the, uh, Mr. Shivambu and one or two of the others might have taken affront at the suggestion that um, if something incompatible or incompatible with constitutionalism itself is inserted into a constitution, that that should be the subject of a perpetual and long-term uh, effort on the part of civil society to uh, recover from. And I can uh, just reiterate here that uh, not only Saki, <coughs> but I think any bona fide member, uh, whether business or otherwise in civil society and also political parties, should make it their uh, uh, recurring and enduring endeavor to uh, restore the uh, proper constitutional order should confiscation be inserted into the text of the constitution, should the constitution be made unconstitutional. Now, um, many other examples, and Mr. Shivambu and, uh, from the EFF and others would agree, uh, I assume, that it would be unconstitutional to write into the constitution that the EFF would not be allowed as a party. And if such something would be introduced into a constitution, then it would be incumbent upon the members of the EFF, but not only them, all other people interested in maintaining a constitutional order to restore constitutionality <coughs> without people voted for such an unconstitutional change. So uh, this is uh, in principle completely acceptable. What I suggest um, that there should be a sustained effort uh, by all uh, parties in, uh, interested in maintaining a constitutional order um, to recover from an unconstitutional amendment. And on the principle, everybody here would, uh, does in fact agree. And then finally, um, on the um, question of uh, Mr. Ndlozi and Mr. Hendricks, I could perhaps just say that in the way that they speak um, uh, in terms of confiscation, it apparently they agree that we should call this confiscation but then they want to support that it should be written into the constitution as confiscation. But what I suggest is that they would actually have to be, uh, uh, because if they want to speak of reparations and uh, other ways of uh, takings for the state that they, and, and want to criminalize the actions um, of, of people whom no, none of us have control over today that happened hundreds of years ago, they would, want, they would rather suggest to the portfolio committee or the, this ad hoc committee that the word asset forfeitures should be used. If they want to speak about criminalization and confiscation under uh, criminalization, they should seek to replace the words expropriation without compensation or expropriation no compensation with asset forfeiture. But this is not what the committee is about. And uh, I would suggest to the committee and to parliament uh, that um, asset forfeiture is not what this is about. Um, there are, as I pointed out, many legitimate avenues of uh, remedies for harms and for injustices, including uh, uh, land restoration uh, uh, and other programs that would uh, be much more fruitful and uh, uh, be uh, uh, that um, would, would do much better uh, for to have the attention of Parliament. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Leroux. I think you have uh, eloquently uh, clarified the honorable members, and I have no doubt that uh, when they deliberate on the matters, they will uh, look at your proposals on their merits and demerits. And thank you very much for having a day with yourself. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> honorable uh, uh, Advocate Romano. Chair, I, I see this in hand for who said? Dr. Ndlozi. Dr. Ndlozi, proceed. No, Chairperson, I, I wanted the speaker not to leave by before I clarify his misconception of me. He seems to think I agree uh, with the idea of confiscation being written in the constitution. That is absolute nonsense. That's not my view. And uh, what is going to be integrated there is not going to be confiscation. And uh, I would hope that uh, he reconsiders his position that he must not be like Donald Trump and reject democratic outcomes. Uh, 
thank you, uh, Dr. Ngozi. I think you are perfectly entitled to clarify what you think was not clear. Uh, I think that is perfectly acceptable. Shall we proceed, uh, Advocate uh, Ramano? <coughs> Yeah, the, the next presenter is Matthew Parks uh, from Kosatu. Kosatu. Uh, who is presenting on behalf of Kosatu? Sure. Um, if I can start, Comrade Chair. Um, my name is Matthew Parks from the Congress of South African Trade Unions. Um, Advocate Romano will just be assisting me to share a PowerPoint presentation this morning. Uh, let me thank the committee and yourself, Comrade Chair, for giving space for COSATU <coughs> this morning. Um, I think as a, at the outset, we want to say as COSATU, we support this 18th Amendment Bill of the Constitution wholeheartedly, 100%. Uh, we think it is correct, as long overdue. Our next slide. So, Chair, I think it's important that we start on the correct um, basis for why we need this bill. Um, I think it's to our eternal shame as a nation that we are still one of the most unequal nations in the world, Comrade Chair. Um, this, the Constitution also, which many people correctly cite, it actually plays a very strict and clear obligation upon the state to address the legacies of colonialism and apartheid. And I think we have to admit that collectively as a nation, um, we have failed to significantly advance land reform since 1994. Yes, governors made efforts and so forth, but if you look at the macro, the statistics, we have failed to make a significant dent. Um, and there's a significant danger, Comrade Chair, if we, if we continue to fail to address land reform. There's a small word I, I forgot to put there. So Chair, for us as COSATU and our 17 affiliate unions, we feel the 18th Amendment Bill is a rational intervention. We feel there's a just utilization in the, in the bill for nil compensation for expropriation of land to advance land reform. And in short, Comrade Chair, as COSATU, we support this 18th Amendment Bill as is. Um, next slide. So Chair, I think again, this bill doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes with a direct socioeconomic context of, of apartheid and colonialism's legacies. Um, Chair, we need to look at all of our cities. Um, the millions of people, largely African and colored, who are condemned to live in informal areas or backyard dwellers who lack land title security in the urban areas for their own homes, for the family to set up businesses, et cetera. Of course, in the rural areas, again, we have millions of people who are denied security of tenure, denied access to land, to grow, to contribute to food security, to contribute to economic growth, and to provide surety of, of survival to the families. Again, these are overwhelmingly African and, and colored residents. Our ownership of land, Comrade Chair remains overwhelmingly skewed towards whites and towards males. And of course, Comrade Chair, we don't need to think that we're engaging in philosoph philosophical debates. We simply need to look next door to Zimbabwe of what are the consequences for failing to deal, to deal with land reform. So Chair, since 1994, we don't think we made a significant debt on the part of the colonial land ownership patterns. We also need to look at that the system is not working. Uh, I think honorable members may recall about seven years ago, when the Mala Mala Game Reserve was expropriated, government was effectively held to ransom for a charge of about 800 million rand. That is about a third of the land reform budget for that year. There's no way government can advance land reform if it's being held to ransom with exorbitant compensation demands. And of course, as worse, Comrade Chair, for the next three years, we're going to have a, in effect a budget freeze on all departments, including land reform. Also, Comrade Chair, we felt that it was simply immoral for government to be forced to compensate persons who expropriated land under the party area when they never paid compensation to those owners. So if you go to District 6, to Safari Town, to many rural areas across the country, people never received compensation. So Chair, on the issue of constitutionality and ambiguities, there's been two schools of thought which support um, the expropriation and no compensation. One school of thought says you don't need to amend the constitution, it already empowers the state. Another school of thought says, well, you do need to amend it to provide that powers explicitly. We think it is fine. Let us put these provisions in the constitution to make it clear for all parties, to make it unambiguous. But also, Chair, the bill is positive. Just to go back for a second, Romano. 
it places clear responsibility upon the state. So the state cannot run away from its responsibility to advance land reform. It also provides for clear legal recourse for any disaffected party. Um, next slide. So Chair, um, the two fundamental provisions of the bill, um, the first one is about the, the determination of compensation. So we think the bill is correctly worded. It provides for the expropriating authority, the affected parties to engage on offers, counter offers, to seek consensus. That's where it belongs because the state must be the administrative organ which determines compensation offers on behalf of government. We think it is correct, Comrade Chair, and it's a line of the constitution for any party which is dissatisfied, whether it's the state or the affected parties or other parties to go to courts for legal recourse. That is correct, it's a line of the constitution. So we think it provides the correct balance between the state's administrative functions and the legal oversight and relief mechanisms of the courts. So as Kosato Comrade Chair, we support this provision wholeheartedly. We don't think there's any need for amendment. Um, honorable members you might have seen our original submission tabled in February last year. We did propose amendment to this, but have engaged quite extensively on it over the past year. We feel that the provision is fine as is, and we support it without amendment. Um, next, next slide. Chair, the second provision of the, of the bill about nil compensation. Um, again, Chair, we think the bill is correctly worded and that it empowers the state to determine when nil compensation may be utilized to advance land reform, um, which think chair is correct that it's best, it tasks government to effect the necessary legislative amendments to flesh out the details of this. And of course, the expropriation bill, which is also at now parliament and will be holding public hearings on Thursday, we think is in sync with this amendment bill of the constitution. We support this bill wholeheartedly, Chairperson. We think it provides for the correct balance. Um, next slide. Chair, I think many of the critics of the bill of the amendment bill of the constitution may not be doing themselves a service. We think they need to engage on the expropriation bill. They need to look at the, the modalities and the specific technicalities of it because it provides quite a lot of clarity. For example, when no compensation may be paid, whether it's idle private land, idle state land, abandoned land, land whose owners have in effect profiteered because of state investments or land that poses a risk to life or the environment, et cetera. Um, next slide. So we also think that as you look through the expropriation bill, it also provides significant clarity to everybody on the processes. So the timeframes are quite tight and clear to avoid long drawn out processes which last years and years to frustrate the state. It provides for very clear legal recourse. It deals with the issue of compensation, including nil compensation, and also binds the state to have clear objectives when expropriating. It must be in support of land reform and to look at the rights of affected parties. Next slide. So, Chair, in, in, in essence, as COSATU, um, we support this 18th Constitution Amendment Bill. Um, our support is based upon that we believe the bill compels the state, one, to advance land reform, but two, also to address the legacies of colonialism and apartheid, which are to our shame prevalent across society. Um, it empowers the state significantly to utilize expropriation as a tool to accelerate land reform. And also, Chair, we think correctly, capacity the state to offer nil compensation under clear circumstances and when needed. Chair, this is a useful thing because workers and the public can hold the state legally accountable now for driving land reform. Um, next slide. Chair, our support is also based upon that we believe, despite some hysteria from certain critics, the bill is in line with international norms. We are not the only country to do it, all countries have expropriation legislation. Whether it's the United States, whether it's Europe, whether it's China, whether it's Japan, there's no country which doesn't have it. So it's, clear, it's, cr it's critical to have clear guidelines which spell out what are the terms, the conditions, the processes, et cetera. Chair, we also think the bill provides the, protect, the, right, the right balance to protect the rights of workers. The majority of expropriation, honorable chair, would involve a municipality building a highway or uh, ESCOM building a power station, Department of Water Affairs building a dam, et cetera. And those in most cases would involve a teacher's house, a nurse's house, et cetera. So this, we think this provides the right balance um, because in those instances, those nurses, those teachers would want them to own their houses, would want them to have conversation when there's expropriation. And those are not, so we think that it does provide the right balance. 
Chair, we think the, the bill is useful in terms of providing the checks and balances, the clear timeframes, and the right to legal recourse for any party to seek relief from the courts. Our next slide. Chair, just coming to the end, look, you know, land is always a sensitive issue in any country, more so in South Africa, given our history of colonialism, of apartheid, of land expropriation, and not so long ago, just in the 70s and the 80s, in fact. Um, we think that the, the reaction opposition to the bill is not helpful. Um, it's hysterical, it's often devoid of facts. It's, to be honest, it's engaging cheap populism. We think in essence, Chair, it seeks to preserve the legacy of colonialism and apartheid. Um, it does not help provide for a rational debate when you actually need calm and rational engagement, it's not hysteria. And Chair, the alternative to not dealing with land reform is a ticking time bomb, which you cannot afford as a nation. And in fact, that would be unconstitutional, not to deal with land issues. Chair, we think there is also a, a smaller element of populist opposition to the bill, which again, we think Chair is not based upon reading the bill or the expropriation bill, et cetera. Um, there is a need to always, to, as with any law, to get the right balance, to look at unintended consequences, to look at potential abuses down the road by a municipality, a department, et cetera. We think the bill does provide the right balance to protect the rights of ordinary workers whose rights often are abused by corrupt municipal and departmental officials in collusion with people elements in the private sector. So we think the bill does provide the right balance to prevent such abuses. It will assist us, we think, Chair, to capacitate the state and to accelerate economic growth and job creation. Um, next slide. So Chair, but also we don't want to to pretend this is a magic wand or a silver bullet which resolve all of the land reform issues. And we think government must also take its responsibility for some of the delays. So it is positive that the expropriation bill is now at parliament. However, it was delayed for years because government had previously shortcut the NCP public participation route. The previous parliament failed to pass the restitution land rights amendment bill in time, which was going to reopen the 1913 land claims process for five years. And that bill has not been resuscitated by parliament. There's a regulation of land holdings bill, which is still delayed in the department, which is gonna provide caps of how much land can a particular individual hold, et cetera. There's a land tenure amendment bill. Uh, we welcome the Department of Justice fast tracking the land claims court bill, which will be quite critical to fast tracking on never ending delays in land restitution cases. There is some movement, fortunately, from the chair on the preservation and development of agricultural bill agricultural land bill, which is gonna be quite useful to preserving agriculturally arable land for agriculture, which will provide a certainty for food security as well. But even in commission, when bills have been passed, like the extension of security of tenure amendment act, which provided for land rights management committees at a national and a district level to help resolve land reform disputes. Those clauses are often not being implemented by government. And this is the ESTA act was passed several years ago. Have not been fully implemented. Um, next slide. Chair, I think also the last point to make is that legislation is positive, it provides a legal framework, binds government, etc. But land reform itself is only going to be successful if the new emerging farmers are given access to finance, to training, to materials such as seeds and fertilizers, machinery, they have access to affordable electricity and water, they have transport for the goods to the markets, they have access to retail sectors, and the retail sector doesn't squeeze them of every cent. And of course, they have affordable crop insurance, et cetera. So legislation is one thing, but the practical tools are critical. So in conclusion, Comrade Chair, um, I think as Kosati wanted to say, we overwhelmingly support this bullet bill in full. We don't think there's any need to amendment, amend it. Or we believe it's in line with the constitution and with international norms. We think it's a rational, it's a fair and equitable compromise. Um, it compels and empowers government to accelerate land reform, and we simply cannot afford not to advance land reform rapidly. We think it does provide a balanced protection for all affected parties, but in particular workers. So in essence, Comrade Chair and members, as Kosato would want to urge Parliament to pass this 18th Amendment Bill. Uh, thank you for your time, Chairperson and members. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Parks, thank you very much for representing the interests of the workers so eloquently and for reminding us that uh, this process is not an anti-white uh, process. As uh, 
I said the Freedom Charter and our constitution uh, say South Africa belongs to all who live in it, both black and white. So this process seeks to afford all South Africans, black and white, a, an opportunity to find a solution to the legacy of apartheid and colonialism. And thank you very much for your eloquent uh, input. Uh, <clears throat> honorable members, can we take hands of those who want to ask for questions for clarification? Uh, I see Dr. Melda, uh, Dr. Lotrich, and uh, Dr. Androsi, the uh, <clears throat> doctor's pact. Uh, proceed, uh, Dr. Melda. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I would like to thank Mr. Parks for the presentation. I've got two questions. The first one is he made the point that the idea of expropriation is nothing new and it's not strange and that it's made provision for in different constitutions or legislations in different countries. And he's correct when he says that. Our own constitution obviously makes provision for exactly that in section 25.2 where it says property may be expropriated only in terms of the law of general application, <coughs> A, for public purpose or in the public interest, and then B, subject to compensation. That's exactly what our constitution currently also provides. I would like to ask firstly if, uh, to Mr. Parks, if you could give me examples internationally in other countries where provision is made for expropriation without compensation or for expropriation with zero va value. That's the first question. The second one is, in conclusion, he refers to when he says, he says the bill is in line with the constitution and international norms. I would like to ask him if he could give us the international norms or examples in international law that underpins and makes provision for expropriation without compensation or for expropriation with zero value, the international norms or provisions in that regard. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Melder, I'm not sure if uh, these are fair questions, because uh, Mr. Parks has indicated what the situation is in other jurisdictions and uh, what international law is saying, shouldn't we have thank him for having given us uh, these indicators? And we should use our parliamentary research capacity and our internal party capacities to go and do the research that you want uh, him to uh, <clears throat> give us now. But uh, I'm not going to rule you out. I'm may just I, saying, yes, in I, my I, view, may in I my respond, view. I respond, Chairperson. I, I hear what you are saying, but surely if a presenter <clears throat> comes to us and makes a statement in his presentation that it's international accepted uh, values and norms, Surely he'll be able to enlighten us, and that's all I'm asking in the first instance. And with regard to the other question, if he says this, uh, this, there are numerous examples in other constitutions, surely he can <coughs> then also enlighten us, and I would ask you, ask you to give him the opportunity to do so. I'm sure he can do that. Thank you, sir. Uh, subject to what I've said, uh, Mr. Pax, can you respond? <coughs> <coughs> What did you mean? From the shops there, you see by the school, MGI. Uh, Mr. Parks? Sorry, Commissioner, would you want me to respond to Dr. Milder now, or should we wait for the other honorable members' questions and do uh, one okay. response? Okay, I think you are, you are right. Uh, let's wait for the others. Thank you for your assistance. Uh, can we take other hands? Uh, Dr. Lothrich? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Parks, for your presentation. I would just like to know, in terms of <clears throat> expropriation and the land, uh, what is Kusata's position on the land that is then expropriated? Will it be given to owners to have title deed on the land, or will it revert to the state to be rented or leased out to um for example, emerging farmers. Uh, Dr. Ndozi. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, <coughs> Chairperson. I just wanted a, 
the unpacking of the colonial and apartheid dispossession as original sin. And ask the presenter, don't you agree that the mechanism of resolving this dispossession peacefully through a constitutional order is the best international example to how in fact colonial dispossession was uh, you know, resolved in other parts of the world through wars, through massacres. Isn't this the best possible way to resolve this original scene by adopting a constitutionally democratically arrived solution and managed a repossession of the land? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. Uh, are there any other more hands? I don't see any. Uh, can I request uh, Mr. Parks to respond to these uh, questions of clarity? <clears throat> well, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Um, I think it's a, it's a compliment to Parliament that we have three doctors who are members. I think that shows you the value that South Africa is placing in education. Um, so I think, Honorable Chairperson, to your, co to your comment about this bill not being anti-white, I mean, I would agree with you 100%. Um, I think for us, it's dangerous to take a knee-jerk opposition to this bill. Um, South Africa is big enough for all of us, but we have to allow space. We have to allow for land reform and specifically to target those who are disadvantaged and disempowered not so long ago. Um, Chair, and that will benefit, if I can be very crude, it will benefit white people. It is simply unsustainable to have an economy, to have an agricultural sector, et cetera, where the majority of people don't have significant ownership of land. Um, this is not a theoretical alarmist discussion, but the failures of Zimbabwe are something we must learn from. Um, so there's no person who's going to be comfortable if others are not taken care of. Um, so hence the need for, for this bill to advance land reform. I think to Dr. Mulder, look, I mean, we can provide many countries. Um, I think one is that we must be governed by South Africa's particular socioeconomic consequences situation. We are the country which is the most unequal in the world. We've long ago even passed Brazil in the inequality stakes. We are now 27 years into democracy. We have failed to make progress there. And there are many countries which, which have used not only expropriation, but expropriation without compensation. Countries, other African countries, which had similar um, experiences of deprivation of land, of colonialism, etc. cetera. The countries in Latin America, and Asia, Eastern Europe, China, Korea, Japan, etc. They've all gone through this process, Chair. I think, Chair, it's also important, as I think Honorable Member Shivambu was saying before, this is not a one-sided conversation. When colonialism arrived in South Africa, when apartheid was here a few decades ago, there was no compensation. We're now trying to correct a wrong, but to do it in a more just and a more humane and democratic and constitutional manner, not in a crude manner. Um, I think, Honorable to Dr. Lothrit, our preference is for, is for people to own their land. Our preference would be for farm workers to have security and own their own particular farm land. We kind of a position where farm workers live on a farm for 30 years, 40 years, something happens at the farm and they're evicted to live under a bridge and they've lost the means of economic survival, they lost their homes, etc. So our preference is for people to own their land. But of course, in some instances, the state might want to lease land long-term leases, et cetera, might be done to give people time to get on their feet, et cetera. But our real preference is for the ownership of land. Um, so they are fully empowered. When a person owns the land, they will take care of it, they will thrive, et cetera. <clears throat> the mean for other economic opportunities in the future, they decide to sell that land down, down the road. I think Chair, Honorable Dr. Ndlozi, I would agree with him 200%. I think he has put it very elegantly, Comrade Chair, to say this constitutional amendment, which seeks a peaceful transition and resolution of the original sin is the correct option. Um, and again, we simply need to go to other countries and see what are the consequences of not addressing our issues peacefully. What is the chaos in Zimbabwe or many other African countries, the difficulties in different countries in Asia, if you don't address this problem correctly, is going to be a, a festering cancerous sore, which is going to condemn us forever um, we think the way it's been dealt with Comrade Chair is constitutional, is rational. I think there's been, what is it, three or four years now of extensive parliamentary engagements nationally and provincially. Um, we think it's going to be dealt with in a way which is going to benefit everybody, Chair. And the specific wording in the 18th Amendment Bill, and if you look at the expropriation bill, its twin sister, 
provides that sense of clarity to everybody, to all affected parties. But also, committee, I think lastly, puts a very clear mandate upon the state to say this is the responsibility of the state and the public can hold the state accountable for not addressing land reform or for not doing it in a correct way, etc. Um, I hope I've answered the questions, honorable members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Parks and uh, Honorable Gumede. <clears throat> Chair, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks as well for the presentation. I, I, I hope, Chair, you, you will be in a position, you were correct when, in fact, you were trying to intervene and, uh, you know, make some other, for instance, you were talking about our own researchers having to do uh, the work that as MPs, we are asking the presenters. I think if we were in fact given the right, we were going to give you the right to say, have the powers to rule out some of the questions because some other questions are very, very much unnecessary. It's very much well known <clears throat> that in many instances it was in Africa that uh, the confiscation, that uh, because now it looks as if there is a new way, uh, the confiscation now happened mainly in Africa. It's not like in other international countries. So to say to the presenter that let that person then give an example of any other countries where such a thing happened, it was going to be an unfair. So my comment chair was, I'm not sure, but it's late. We should have taken this decision when we start because the, 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 the questions that are being asked are very, very much um, provocative. They seem to be entering uh, the territory of being debated. At the very same time, we are trying to avoid debates. So, Chair, if you may have a ruling on this one, I'll be happy. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable uh, Gumede, I agree with you 200%. Uh, and that's why uh, I said to Mr. Parks, please, in my view, these are unfair questions, but answer them subject to uh, my uh, ruling, my, my view. And uh, he, I think, did exceptionally well. And uh, he has provided us uh, with hints as to how we should guide our researchers to do the work uh, for us, not to ask the presenters to do the research for us. But I fully agree with you, uh, 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 Honorable Gumede. Uh, Dr. Melda, you want to have a second bite? <clears throat> and I uh, also you. recognize the Honorable Tala. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairperson. I, I hear what Mr. Gumede is saying, and I hear what you are saying, but I find it rather strange that, that, that Mr. Parks ends his presentation in his conclusion. We can go back to the last slide, and he makes the following statement. He says, the bill is in line with the constitution and international norms. How can you rule that if I ask him to explain those international norms, that it's out of order? How can you make a statement and I'm not allowed to ask him what he means? Uh, Dr. Melda, I said from the outset that uh, we should allow uh, individual opinions and uh, it is not for us in this meeting to discuss the merits or demerits of those opinions. Uh, as the committee, we will sit and engage with the merits of all uh, submissions. So uh, let's let the matter rest at, at that because we will have our own time to deal with all the submissions. Uh, Honorable Kaba. <clears throat> uh, uh, Good morning, uh, Chairperson and, uh, and colleagues and, 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 our, and, and uh, our guest. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Let me also thank uh, Mr. Parks for his uh, eloquent uh, submission uh, uh, this, this morning. And it certain, certainly clarifies <clears throat> a number of issues that uh, 
uh, needed, um, you know, amplification. And uh, I, I want him to <clears throat> uh, respond to, or rather make a comment to the statement that uh, Dr. Mulder, uh, the honorable member uh, made, and uh, where <clears throat> he agrees with him that uh, uh, expropriation uh, is, is permitted uh, in our constitution and uh, is also permitted in some of uh, <clears throat> uh, pieces of legislation that uh, parliament uh, has passed. And also that is consistent with uh, what is found in a number of uh, jurisdictions across the, uh, across the world. But then he says uh, <clears throat> expropriation uh, must be subject to compensation and uh, he ends there. That's what Dr. Muda does. He says uh, expropriation uh, is subject to compensation. He doesn't go uh, further to say that the amount, that's what is in the constitution, that the amount of compensation and, uh, must be just and equitable uh, after having <coughs> taken into account uh, a, a number of factors that are mentioned in section 25.3 of the constitution. And uh, one of those factors are factors that uh, I would consider them as uh, representing the interest of the affected, you know, the current use of the property, market value of the property, and of course, other factors. <clears throat> and then the other set of factors, I'll, I'll, I'll take them to be uh, in the public interest, uh, history of uh, acquisition, historical use of the property, direct investment, direct state investment and subsidy, purpose of uh, expropriation. In other words, we have these two factors that uh, stand side by side. Don't you, uh, don't you look at this, um, uh, Mr. Parks, as uh, the, that the price would uh, be an outcome of an evaluative process that takes into account all these factors, which may, in the end, which may in some cases, ultimately result to a nil uh, compensation. In other words, <clears throat> it's, 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 yeah. Uh, would you want to comment on, 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 on that? Thanks. Uh, Honorable Kawa. Yes, sir. I, I, I think uh, your questions are legitimate. It's just that Honorable Parks had to observe the time limit, but uh, this is the opportunity for him uh, to uh, throw more light on what you have said, uh, we'll give him time to do so. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, um, no, I'll be very quick, Commissioner, because I know you're under significant time pressures with a very packed program. Um, so I think, Chair, if we were to look at which countries around the world have gone through this process before, you would find that it's basically, in essence, all former colonies. Um, throughout Africa, we can find examples, whether it's in Mozambique or Angola, which had 500 years of colonial, colonial rule by Portugal. Um, of course, there's Zimbabwe next door, which has gone through a similar process. Namibia has also gone through similar processes. Tanzania has gone through it too. But Chair, even beyond the, the, beyond the colonialist experiences of former colonies in Africa, Latin America and Asia, um, we do have <laughs> in Europe, after World War II, when Germany occupied significant parts of Europe, took over possessions. There was no compensation given to Germany when they had to leave. It was for a shorter space of time, but the principles are the same. Japan occupied many countries in Asia for far longer. Um, they occupied large parts of Northern China, Southeast Asia, etc. during World War II, before World War II. When they left, there was no compensation given to them. Um, so I'm not sure why we are so hesitant to deal with this thing in a, in a peaceful and constitutional way that Honorable Dr. Nclosia said. This is the far better route than to go the kind of the more rough routes that other countries have gone through. I think to Honorable Klaba Chair, I mean, I think for us, the, we, must, we must take the 18th Constitution Amendment Bill and the Exploration Bill hand in hand together because they speak to each other. They are they're intrinsically linked. And we think they are quite fair that they... This will be a tool 
to advance land reform. So it's not a blank check for government to run wild. <coughs> advance land reform, and it specifies what are the types of land to look at. How can you argue against abandoned land being expropriated? How can you argue against unutilized state land being expropriated? That conversation. Um, why should you not argue against land being expropriated when it poses a risk to the environment, to property, to health, etc., of other persons? So I think, Chair, those are very clear instances. We have a shortage of arable land. We can't afford for large tracts of land not being utilized when you have millions of people condemned to living in former areas, in backyard dwellers, when you have millions of farm workers who would love to till the land, even a small piece of land, but we are denying them the opportunity to do so at, at the risk of the entire nation. And I think, Chair, the expropriation bill and this amendment bill speak fundamentally to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It says government must address the legacy of apartheid colonialism. It must look at the public interest. It must look at how was a property acquired. If I acquired a property in District 6 in the 1970s and I never paid compensation for that owner who's still alive, by the way, why should I now get compensation from the state when I never paid compensation at that time? Or if I did, it was a mockery amount of two rand or whatever it was. So I think, Chair, the, the bills are very clear on the conditions, the rights of persons, the processes, et cetera. It's not a, a check for government to misbehave, but as a significant capacitation tool to advance land reform in a rational and equitable and a just way. So I think, Chair, we'll be making, making a fundamental mistake of not supporting this bill and even the expropriation bill later. This is a unique opportunity for us to try to address our problems in a cohesive <clears throat> and unifying way, as opposed to doing it in a reckless way, and simply to ignore a cancerous cell, which, which will explode eventually. Um, hopefully I've answered the questions, Honorable Chair. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pax. I think uh, we shall... Thank you, Mr. Pax. I think we shall all agree that uh, South Africa opted for a negotiated settlement to avoid the imposition of the will of the major majority on the minorities. We are not doing this work behind the backs of our people. We have allowed public participation with due regard to the constitutional guidelines laid down by the Constitutional Court. So I want to say, uh, like uh, Mr. Pax, that we should agree with the uh, Dr. Ndozi, that uh, a peaceful resolution of the challenges facing us is better than uh, an uh, armed conflict. And uh, this process seeks to avoid any conflict, uh, armed or otherwise. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Advocate uh, Ramanu. <clears throat> Yes, okay. The next presenter is from the SA Property Owners Association. Thank you. SA Property Owners Association. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Honorable Chair. I I'm <coughs> here to represent the uh, South African Real Estate Investment Trust and the South African Property yes. Owners Association. Gibson, I don't know where the cover number is. Proceed, please. I proceed. Um, and <clears throat> you have, or the committee has, the uh, written representations, and the um, in this oral representation, I merely seek to highlight four of the main aspects of those submissions. The first one is uh, a general comment, really in relation to the uh, need for the, for the amendment. And then the others refer to specifics within the um, amendment bill. So in relation to the general comment, <clears throat> if I can start by referring to the second preamble, and the second preamble to the uh, bill says, and whereas section 25 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996, must be amended to make explicit that which is implicit therein. So I highlight to make specific that which is implicit therein, and I highlight the word must, um, because essentially what the representations that were made from the property owners I represent 
in the past was that imbued in the terms of Section 25 of the Constitution as it currently exists is a right to award just and equitable compensation, which in an appropriate case, an exceptional case, but an appropriate case, may well amount to uh, no compensation, um, to a null figure. So it's there already. And the point that is made and raised is why in those circumstances should one uh, tinker with the constitution itself and make amendments when the same result can be achieved if it's implicit in the constitution by making changes to the expropriation code. And the point that's made is that when one changes the constitution, that brings with itself all sorts of um, other consequences, um, some which will be anticipated, some which will be unintended. It leads to a loss of confidence, a loss of confidence perhaps in the permanency of the constitution itself, but also can lead to, through perceptions, drops in um, the value um, of, of, of property. It can lead to a loss of investment. That in turn has impacts on rate collection, all sorts of areas, mortgage borrowers. And so the point that's made, and it's a general point, is that if it's implicit, why must it be amended? And the submission is that it would be a better course not to follow that road um, and simply achieve the same result, but do it through an amendment of the Expropriation Act without tinkering with the Constitution. Then moving on, to the three specific features. The they're all fairly, uh, two of them are fairly technical and the third is a matter of, I suggest, of principle. Um, the first one is that as the amendment stands now, paragraph 2B of the constitution as amended by this uh, bill will render the current expropriation bill 2020 in its latest form unconstitutional because there's a con there's a conflict between section 12.3 and and um, this section section 12.3 of the um, expropriation bill deals with no compensation to be paid where land is expropriated in the public interest this one limits that to one area of public interest for the purpose of land reform. So it's more restrictive in the constitution, not necessarily a complaint, but what one is saying is that therefore it's going to require an amendment um, to the expropriation bill because there is that conflict. The second feature is that it should be made um, apparent rather than implicit that a court when assessing the question of null compensation in determining whether there's going to be compensation or no compensation, has to, of course, approach the um, matter in terms of subsection 3 of section 25 of the Constitution. That requires that the compensation um, must be just and equitable reflecting an equitable balance between the public interest and interests of those affected, having regard to all relevant circumstances. And that duty we submit should be incorporated back into the proviso in section 1, uh, 1B, so that before there's a reference to subsection 3A, there should also be a reference to section 3. That will just make it clear that a court determining the matter has to deal with it in this way, which may be implicit, but there's no harm in making it express. And then finally, the other feature that attention has been drawn to is the fact that it will be virtually impossible in a piece of legislation to identify every case or a case um, with precision as to where it's, when it's appropriate that there should be uh, no compensation at all that's payable. When to do that would be just and equitable. Um, we say that it would be impossible to circumscribe this in a piece of legislation 
because the practical circumstances of each owner whose property is expropriated cannot be foreseen by the legislature. And we say the way around this, the best way to, uh, to do in these instances would be to make the qualification of justice and equity um, that we have in the constitution by um, strengthening that, by putting the burden of proof on each instance on the expropriating authority. And because there are so, so few, there are a number of individuals who wouldn't be able to withstand the anxiety and costs of litigation, that one should add to that by saying um, that all null compensation cases should be put before a court by the state where the onus of proof will be on the state to prove in a given case that it's just and equitable that null compensation be paid. So it shouldn't be left to administrative decisions. If you get to the stage where no compensation is going to be paid, then it's submitted that that is something that a judge should rule on and that the matter should go before a court and that the burden of proof on a balance of probabilities should rest on the state. In the written representations, we've proposed certain amendments. They appear at page nine of 12 of the lecture B to the um, submissions. The first would be to add subsection three into the current subsection 2B. And the uh, last one, we submit an important one is that a proviso should be added to the proposed subsection 3A that would read as follows, provided that in every case where the state expropriates at null compensation, the state has to obtain an order of court that it's just and equitable to pay null compensation in the specific case. This we submit would provide um, adequate uh, protection, would maintain the integrity of the uh, constitution and make it clear that the equivalence principle that comes from the uh, structure of just and equitable compensation reflecting an equitable balance between the public interest and interests of those affected having regard to all the circumstances in a given, given case is that no compensation is appropriate in that case. Those are our submissions. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you say that uh, the proposed amendment will lead to the loss of uh, investment. Mr. Pax said that uh, failure to carry out the amendment will be placing the country on a time bomb. Do you think there are people who want to invest in a country which sits on a time bomb. Can you clarify that before I open the floor? Yes, of course, Mr. Chair. What our submission is, is that it's unnecessary to amend the constitution in order to achieve the result that Mr. Parks wants. Mr. Parks can achieve the same result because it's implicit in the constitution as it currently stands, that you can have a situation where it's just and equitable where no compensation is payable. Mr. Parks himself said that there are two schools of thought, those that say it's implicit in the constitution and those that say it's necessary for there to be amendment. We fall into the school of thought that says it's implicit. And if you amend, then that in itself, the very act of amending generates headlines, generates interest, generates controversy. And that if it's unnecessary, um, is unnecessary and that act itself can lead to a loss of investment, loss of confidence in the constitution and so on. So that's the point. Not that this shouldn't be done, but that it shouldn't be done by way of a constitutional amendment because that's not necessary. Thank you for that uh, clarity. Honorable uh, Murasetla and uh, Honorable Dr. Ndlozi, Honorable Kawa, in that order. <clears throat> Chairperson, good morning, and good morning. Uh, to everybody in this all-important portfolio comic. Uh, my chair, um, uh, you were almost a step ahead 
of what I wanted to raise. But however, let me indicate that uh, research statistics confirms in no uncertain terms that South Africa is one of the most unequal country in the world. It falls in the most top uh, category of those countries which are very much unequal. I hear uh, my friend or a colleague from properties in South Africa talking about the drops in the value of um, property and also the lost, I mean, the loss of investments. Should we go anyway in trying to amend Section 25 as we are busy doing? Uh, one can just argue, Prof, that maybe that is just uh, a propagation of the maintenance of the status quo. Uh, it's just very unfortunate. But uh, I, I want to ask a question to the presenter. If the presenter is satisfied with the unequal nature within this country, which one can openly indicate as a crime against the indigenous people of this country? Is he satisfied? Is he contented with uh, the current status quo of the indigenous and those who invaded this land. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable uh, Murasata, uh, Honorable Dr. Ndozi. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. Uh, I, I, I really just have two questions. One is that uh, uh, just coming out very clear uh, uh, to the presenter, are you saying you agree <laughs> with expropriation of uh, land without compensation and uh, you just don't think it must be a constitutional amendment. Are you saying that it's okay for us uh, to go and expropriate land without compensation as a way to resolve uh, the historic injustices? I just want to come out clear that the property owners in South Africa agree with that. Uh, secondly, how come you do not address yourself to the significance of the colonial impasse? The reality is what we are trying to resolve are not instances. We're trying to resolve a colonial confiscation, a colonial possession, dispossession of the land. You're the second presentation that comes from business or property owners. None of you are addressing themselves. Isn't that a little bit dishonest? Because we have all been clear that what we are trying to resolve with this amendment is the fact that there is this historic injustice which benefited European descents, which are the members of your association, majority of which are white. How come you do not address yourself to this important question and the fact that we are trying to resolve it through legal means and a peaceful process of repossession in ways that uh, are going to uh, uh, be much more sustainable? How come none of you uh, are addressing themselves to this colonial question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. Uh, I recognize Honorable Tawa and uh, Honorable Shibambo in that order. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And let me also thank the presenter for uh, uh, talking to us uh, this morning. And um, <clears throat> he says, why tinkering with the constitution when the same results uh, could be achieved uh, by uh, or within the status quo or maintaining the status quo, and uh, and and that and then and and he goes on to say that um, uh, you know uh, changing the constitution may actually uh, frighten the investors or drop. Uh, uh, or resulting drop in the value of uh, or values of uh, uh, property. Now I'm I'm asking myself uh, why really <clears throat> you would be so concerned when the sole intention is to make uh, explicit that which is uh, implicit, 
and the and 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 the draft is out there for everyone to see, and not to read uh, into it anything that is not, um, you know, uh, uh, on 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 the draft uh, uh, itself. And uh, <clears throat> why you would uh, there would be so concerned and uh, uh, when Parliament uh, does this only to uh, make things clear that which were not uh, you know clear in in in, in the public w would you uh, enlighten us uh, on on that point? Uh, thanks, uh, Honourable Shibambo. No, thank you very much, Chair. I wanted to check with the presenter on, on whether he doesn't think that if we, we mainstream court's involvement in cases of reposition of land without compensation, we are now blurring the separation of powers where in each and every case, whenever there must be an administrative action, or a, a, a an, an action to take the land must <clears throat> always involve the courts, even when there's no dispute. Because I thought the courts are created for to, to as recourse when someone thinks that something unjust has been done on them. Why should we, on a constant basis, involve the courts in terms of uh, the land reform? So it may, we're going to overburden the courts, which have got many other things and other responsibilities to deal with. Uh, it, it's a problematic notion in the manner that it is. I want, I want uh, him to talk to that. But also, I want to hear his view on uh, Section 25, Subsection 7, which says that uh, a person or community dispossessed of property after 19 June 1913 as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or, or practices entitled to the extent provided by an act of parliament, what, 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 what does he think we should do with that portion of the legislation? Should we leave it like that or we should delete it? Uh, let's hear what, what he's got to say. Thank you, Honorable Shibambo. Um, uh, can you proceed uh, on, uh, Mr. Presenter? Yes, certainly, thank you. Honorable. What is your name again? It's uh, Morris Pillama, I'm an advocate at the Durban Bar. I'm instructed to to provide this presentation. That's who I am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Advocate. <clears throat> thank you. Um, just in relation to why one shouldn't make something explicit when it's implicit, and why that would um, lead to um, disinvestment. The, the, the point that's made in the representations is really this, that if it's not necessary because it's implicit, when one does it and makes it explicit, it provokes controversy, it provokes um, public uh, debate and interest, <clears throat> it has an effect on perceptions worldwide and perceptions within the country. And it leads to perceptions of the constitution being relatively easily changed. And it may well result in um, loss of confidence and loss of investment. And the point that's made in the representations is if it's not necessary, why take the chance? Simply that. The attack isn't on the uh, fundamental basis. The attack is only at the level of, there are all sorts of consequences that may well flow if you go through with an amendment of the constitution um, based largely on perceptions. And that in turn, if it's not necessary, why do it? That's the point that's made on, be on behalf of the people I represent. Um, the representations deal with the constitutionality and questions of how, if one is taking land from someone else, it should be dealt with. And the constitution deals with it and the amendment deals with it. There's no real significant change there. 
what it says is that in a given circumstance, um, if it is just and equitable, it reflects an equitable balance between public interests and the interests of those affected, and all relevant circumstances are taken into account, the correct uh, value that should be given as compensation is null, then that's correct. So that's the approach. I mean, it always has been there. There will be circumstances where it is appropriate. There'll be special circumstances, I would suggest, and each case will be separate and have its own distinct features. So that was why we said it shouldn't be circumscribed absolutely in litigation. Each case should determine uh, in legislation. Each case should be determined on its own facts. And why should the courts be brought in? Well, because um, it is a significant departure from the generalized norm that when there's expropriation, there's equivalence and there's compensation. So to ensure equivalence, that in a given case, all that's necessary is um, a consideration of all the facts and then come to the conclusion that no compensation is payable in that given case, the proper place to do that isn't an administrative official, it's the courts. And we submit that it will add added protection and will um, strengthen the provision um, if the constitution is to be amended in this way to incorporate um, such a provision. Um, I think I've answered the questions. It's not my place to talk about uh, colonialism in the past. I'm not instructed in relation to that. Um, the representations deal generally with that. I'm here as a representative to express the representations set out in the... Uh, we, ac we accept that. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, just, I, I thought the question about subsection 7 is a constitutional uh, I've no, I've issue. No reason to suggest that that should be changed. Okay. And Dr. Shabambo, are you covered? I, I didn't hear the, the response. There's no suggestion uh, that there should be an amendment to section 7. Okay. Uh, Honorable Gumede and Honorable Ndlosi, in that order. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Chair, I, I want to say there is a, a tendency <clears throat> among people to do things that they are saying others must not do. You know, Chair, the exercise we are in, it's really what is being demonstrated by the Constitution. If it was explicit enough for the presenter uh, when their documents were presented, why did he come to us and do the presentation? The feeling was he had in mind that the document that he submitted was not explicit enough. In a sense, it was implicit. That's one of the reasons he is before us, to make what is implicit to be explicit. That is the argument that we are talking about. But he says, <clears throat> Constitution, Let's leave it implicit so that uh, people will keep on asking. Because if we ask questions, as we're asking questions, we're asking questions because the, the, the presentation is somehow implicit. We want clarifications. In his attempt to respond, he is trying to make it implicit, uh, explicit rather. So what I'm saying, you can't practice uh, what you are not preaching. This is same with the Constitution. If then Parliament discovered that what is being contained in the Constitution is not explicit enough for people to understand that expropriation of land can be obtained <laughs> 
uh, through the process of nil compensation. We just want to make that one explicit, educate, make people aware that the process can be done. So to effect that, we need to go and make the necessary amendments, as is the case with them. They had to come before us and present to us to make explicit what they deemed implicit in their presentation. That's what I wanted to explain, Chair. That let us be honest to the process that we processes that we are doing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Gumede. Uh, uh, Ms. Advocate Presenter, uh, <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, Honorable Gumede is not a lawyer, but uh, I think uh, he articulates what uh, you should know better, that ignorance of the law is no excuse. And because of that principle, legal certainty is paramount. And what Honorable Gumede is saying, is saying we have to ensure that legal certainty so that uh, even the so-called ordinary people should know what the law is saying. And therefore the question of making explicit what is implicit would give effect to legal certainty. Now, uh, can you respond to uh, all the questions and uh, also deal in particular with what Honorable Gumeda has said? Thank you. Yes, I think I've dealt with most of the other questions already, but in relation to making the law explicit, may I must just say this, that as Mr. Park said, there are two schools of thought. <clears throat> One lot says it's implicit and it's not necessary. The other lot says, even though it's implicit, um, it is necessary and must be made explicit. That's what the preamble to the um, bill says. And that obviously was the thinking of the draftsman of that preamble. The only point that was being made was that making it expressed and it not <coughs> implicit carries with it the risk of consequences. Those are dealt with in the And that the pre representation suggested that it was not necessary to take that risk if it was implicit. That's the only point that was being made. The point isn't that there's, uh, it shouldn't necessarily be done, what it was saying is that by making it express, you're tinkering with the constitution. By tinkering with the constitution, that has consequences, and those consequences, may, some of them unintended, may well prevail. If you can do it without tinkering with the constitution, according to those I represent, that's a better proposition. That's all that, that's all that was being said in the presentation. Thank you, uh, Advocate. Uh, I think uh, the honorable members have heard you and uh, then in their deliberations, they will look at what you are saying uh, on its merits and demerits. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, I see another hand, uh, Honorable Gumede. Honorable Gumede. Withdraw because the intention here is not to debate. Because I wanted to say, currently, if we don't, consequences have just shown shown it shown themselves, or consequence has just shown itself. Look at the state or the level of invasions that we have. We don't want a situation which may be interpreted as is the Zimbabwe situation. But what is going to happen, people are going to invade and take land forcefully, which we are trying to avoid. But I'm sorry, Chair, to have taken your time. No, 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 that's a, a perfectly, uh, 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 an observation that is perfectly 
in order. Thank you for having made it. Uh, uh, there are no more hands. Uh, Advocate Ramano. Uh, Chair, the next presenter is from the from. Hello. Helen Foundation. Which foundation? The Helen Sussman. Okay, thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Advocate Ramano. Helen Sussman Foundation. Good the, morning. Uh, <clears throat> good morning to you. Morning, Mr. Chair. Um, let me just put. Um, what is your name? Um, my name is Anton van Dalsen. I'm, uh, my position is that of legal counselor at the Helen Sussman Foundation. Thank you very much. Could I just ask the secretary, I did send a copy of my presentation. Um, are you able to put that on the screen, Mr. Romano? Mr. Chair, shall I proceed? Uh, yes, proceed, please. Um, in our opinion, the existing Section 25 of the Constitution already makes provision for expropriation um, without compensation. Th thank you, Mr. Romano. If we can go to the first page or the next page, please. Yeah, there we go. Um, Section 25.8 if you read it carefully, expressly states that no provision of section 25 may impede the state from acting to achieve land reform, provided it is done on a reasonable and justifiable basis, taking all relevant factors into account and is done by way of laws of general application. Now, for me, this is pretty explicit. So uh, I also refer to the preamble in the bill and the, to the, uh, we can refer to the discussion with the previous presenter about whether it should be implicit or, or made explicit. But on my reading of section 25.8, it is actually explicit. Could we go on to the next page, please? Now, the debate over the past <coughs> more, more than two years has focused purely on the need to change the constitution. This is now the debate on land reform, but no attention has been given to the very serious underlying problems of the land reform process. And these factors that in our view are extremely serious are the following. <coughs> the first one is the corruption, inefficiency and incompetence that has been displayed in the process so far. And I take these words directly from the high level panel report of 2017 which was uh, done under the chairmanship of Kalema Motlante. Secondly, the extremely slow pace of restitution. And thirdly, a minimal budget provision. And if you look at the current budget, land reform, restitution, and farmer support account for 0 0.35 of total government expenditure. And that includes debt service costs. That is an extremely small provision for something which is so important. The next point is a failure to amend the existing Expropriation Act of 1975. Now there is a draft uh, bill or a bill in parliament at the moment, but it's not clear yet when that will be accepted. But the fact remains that no efforts have been made or no successful efforts have been made since 1975 to change the situation. And the final point here, also very important, and that is an absolute incapacity of the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform to perform its functions, which even led to the Constitutional Court to allow the outsourcing of certain of these functions. And this happened less than two years ago, where the Constitutional Court effectively allowed an outside entity to help that department with the processing of uh, the claims of labor, uh, thousands of labor tenants because the department was clearly not able to deal with it. Now, I get onto the questions that must be answered and, and you will see that the proposed change to section 25 does not deal with any of these questions. And these questions 
for me are paramount. <coughs> First of all, how are decisions on expropriation going to be taken? What criteria are to be applied in these decisions? Who are to be the beneficiaries and how are they going to be chosen? Will the process be transparent? Is post-settlement support to be provided to beneficiaries or will they be left to their own devices? What legal rights will beneficiaries have? Will they have full legal title? Will a properly staffed and funded land reform agency manage the process in an efficient manner in compliance with relevant legislation and regulations? Is there a political will to address these questions? And will the process be given sufficient certainty and predictability to avoid a further shock to business and investor confidence? And in that last point, I just want to emphasize when we talk about investor confidence, I think what is very, very important is that investors want predictability. They want to know what the situation is. So one needs in legislation to be very clear and also in administrative regulations to be very clear what can and what cannot be done. Uh, and I'm not saying something should or should not be done, but the way in which it is done is very important. It needs to be formulated very carefully so that investors and business people know what they're in for. And then we come to the conclusion, and this is that not so much the change of Section 25 of the Constitution, but all the questions that I've raised, all the problems that have arisen over the past years, if these questions are not addressed in an effective and convincing manner, the land reform process will not succeed. And it can be expected that if a transparent, rational and clearly defined administrative process for land reform is not laid down and carefully followed, legal proceedings will bring the process to a halt. The underlying issues need to be addressed for any progress to be achieved and focusing only on the proposed change to section 25 of the constitution, therefore on its own offers no, no uh, final solution. So uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. That, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Anton van Delsen. Uh, <clears throat> I hear you that uh, there was a failure to address, uh, uh, to amend the expropriation bill of 1975. Uh, that process is now underway. And uh, you are raising questions which you think uh, must be addressed, but uh, those questions cannot be addressed in a constitution. They will be addressed by the uh, amendment to the expropriation Act of 1975. Lastly, we have also invited the relevant departments, including the Department of uh, Rural Development to appear before us. So don't worry about political will because uh, those departments and the political leadership uh, are hard at work to deal with those uh, issues. But uh, I just wanted to draw that to your attention that you should not fear that government is not doing the necessary. Uh, can I take uh, hands? Uh, I see Honorable Kama. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, good morning, Advocate. Uh, uh, advocate, um, uh, Advocate Van Delsen, uh, am I Delsen. correct? Delsen. Yes. Thank you very much. You see, you not you you you'll now understand our dilemma as uh, as parliamentarians. You see, <clears throat> earlier on we had uh, Mr. Leroux before us. He says, "Man, look, your your amendment uh, introduces uh, uh, you know expropriation without compensation." He says that's conspiration. Why are you doing it? And uh, <clears throat> then he goes on to explain and uh, what he means by saying that uh, expropriation without compensation is conspiration and how wrong that, 
that that is and so on and so forth. And uh, you are saying to us, no, in actual fact, section 25.8 and uh, already makes a provision for economy, for, for expropriation without uh, compensation, you know? And you are saying, you, you, in actual fact, you are saying it's there, yep. you know? And, uh, okay, <clears throat> I want to leave. I'm trying to explain to you that there the, 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 the is a difference of opinion. One says you are bringing in a new thing, you are importing this thing into the constitution, and you are saying it is there, okay? These are the two presentations that we received this morning. And then the second uh, uh, parallel that I want to draw is when you say to us that um, you, as far as you are concerned, and uh, the 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 this clause the, this clause is explicit, you know. Yep. And um, and uh, in actual fact, you are wrong. That's I'm trying to interpret it to say that you 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 are make you want to make explicit that which is implicit because uh, as far as you are concerned, it's or it's explicit. But. Yep. Your uh, advocate, uh, Pelliman, who was who was just before you, he says, "Hey, you guys, what are you doing? Because, and uh, in actual fact, and uh, that which you, it, it, no, no, what are you doing? Because that thing is explicit. By making it explicit, you'll still get the same results. Why tinkering with the constitution? Okay, uh, I'm saying we've already had four people." And uh, who are presenting two different uh, understanding of where of 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 uh, their own reading of the constitution, you know, and and but they're blaming us for actually making the, the this clause uh, to articulate exactly we, what we want it to articulate, so that we bring it beyond this debate that we have just entered into. We're actually making it even more certain than what is already, what could, what is already found in, in the clause. Why are we being blamed for doing that? You can see our dilemma. I've just put, I mean, put you and, uh, and advocate Pelleman on the other side and said, look, there is difference of opinion. And I've also put you and, um, and uh, Mr. Leroux and also said there is difference of opinion. Now we want to close that, but you are and and the public is, but you are blaming us for doing it. I, I just want to comment on that. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Dalsi, uh, I think Honorable Kawa is actually vindicating Honorable Gumede that uh, there is a need for legal certainty because uh, if uh, advocates like yourselves cannot be at one with regard to the interpretation of the constitution, what about uh, the so-called uh, ordinary uh, people? I hope uh, you will come and deal with that uh, uh, concern that uh, Honorable Kawa and Honorable Gumede have raised, which is a legal principle that uh, laws must be legally set, uh, certain. Uh, I recognize Honorable Shibambo and Honorable Muraset. I, I, I... No, thanks, Chair. Uh, if, if the, the presenter is saying that subsection eight is arguing that it's, it's presenting for expropriation without compensation or there's a that possibility. Why is he opposed to it becoming explicit? Why, what is the basis? Because he says that it's already there. So why, 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 why should Ellen Susman Foundation come to Parliament? They came to make the same presentation. They're coming to make the same presentation again. So why oppose if you're saying it's already there in the constitution? So why oppose to it when we are saying we should make it clearly now? And another view which he must make an, a, 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 an opinion on, because it's being repeated by most of the presenters today here of saying that 
expropriation of land without compensation or reposition of land without compensation is going to scare away investors. Are they aware that the majority of investments in South Africa is happening on state-owned land? All state-owned, uh, uh, special economic zones are state-owned lands. Kuha is state-owned land. East London, Dubai Trade Port, Atlantis, Musina, the, the SEZs in Gauteng, all of them are state-owned land. So where, where does this scarce crow come from that all of a sudden when we have control of the, of the land, the, the investments is, is going to stop when it is happening now? And the pattern has been, it, it has been happening. And in, in most instances, private ownership of land has been prohibitive of, of investments because investors do not gain access to that land, which in most instances is overpriced by the private occupiers of land now. So where does this thing come from that all of a sudden there will be a change in terms of the investment attitude, which the little as, as it is, that, that has been coming, that's why has been happening on state owned land. And, and I don't know where that, 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 that thing comes from in terms of uh, what happens. Uh, th- thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Honorable Chibambo. Uh, I think uh, those observations you are making uh, are very, very important and they, they must be addressed. Uh, Honorable Mwasetla. Chairperson, thank you once again. Um, you see, the, uh, I'm not so sure whether it's Advocate, Advocate Anton uh, or whoever, but uh, I, I know his name he said is Anton. Um, he's the it's second advocate, It's Advocate Anton Dalson. Okay, no, yeah, whatever. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, not whatever, because uh, this discussion is being recorded, and then 25 years here after, people must know who made what point. Thank you. Okay, you said the same name is because the name uh, is Anton. Dalson. From... Yeah, Al- Al- Anton Dalson. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you, are you, I'm getting educated. Um, in some of this surname, which I didn't know. Uh, the advocate is the second, if not the third person, to assert that there is no need to amend Section 25. And um, the attributory reason, Comrade <clears throat> uh, Honorable Shivambo has just indicated that uh, he is saying what we want to achieve in our ditch to amend this section 25 is already contained in subsection eight of section 25. But our argument, as you have also indicated, Chairperson, is that what worries the cat if this committee, as per its mandate, rises up to say our main aim is to make explicit that which is implicit. Why can't they join us in doing that simple thing? Because I, I, if it is true that the argument says the intended goal is already contained in subsection eight, why can't they come on fold in order to support us? Especially that we are talking about a legal minds here who should be able to say, okay, let's agree and assist you to make explicit that which we also see to be implicit. You see, for more than 26 years, uh, the, 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 what they say is contained has never been realizable. Our people have not benefited from it. Now, at a point where we want to make it very clear so that the people the disadvantages masses of our people must benefit is now that they say what you want has been there for more than 25 years. So I think, and I'm going to urge uh, the advocate that uh, let them join hands and assist us implement this once and for all. And this is the plea that I will make and the submission that I'll make. Thank you very much, Jefferson. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Murasata. Uh, advocate uh, Anton Dalson. I'm sure you have heard uh, Honorable Gumede 
emphasizing the importance of legal certainty. He was supported by Honorable Kawa and Honorable Murasetla. Uh, I think Murasetla, Honorable Murasetla is saying, you as legal giants, what problem do you have with making explicit what is implicit so that understanding of the law should not be a preserve of uh, legal minds and courts, but that the majority of the people, so-called ordinary people, understand the law equally because the law applies to them as well. Uh, can you address us uh, on these uh, questions uh, which were raised as well as the questions that Honorable Shubambo uh, raised? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the question of explicit or implicit, I think the important thing is for all the submissions that are being made to you to put you into the, in the position that you can make a decision. You need to be aware of all these different issues. Uh, and if you're not aware of the different issues, it's difficult for you to make a decision. So I think that is the background. Um, when I say that it is already there and there's no need to change the constitution, that's a, for me a factual statement, but changing the constitution as is proposed is not going to change anything for me. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to your changing the constitution as you propose. All I'm saying is, well, guys, it's actually there already. You know, do you want to spend all this time and energy on changing something which is there already? Um, and I think that what, and one of the speakers, the uh, Honorable Ronnie Morrow uh, mentioned, the lack of understanding in, in, in the community on uh, why land reform um, action has not been taken as it should by government. And I think what the point to emphasize here is it's not because of the constitution that that action was not taken. I mentioned in my presentation the, in detail the big problems that, that were uh, encountered, and that is corruption, um, elite entitlement, uh, a lack uh, of capacity of the relevant government department, uh, the fact that the Expropriation Act, which still dates from 1975, all, those is all these issues I've just mentioned have nothing to do with the Constitution. And I think it's important to realize that the lack of action and land reform in this country does not derive from the text of the Constitution. It derives mm -hmm. from a lack of government action um, and the um, incompetence and the corruption of whatever action has been taken. I think that is extremely important. So, um, and, and as a last point, the, the point that was raised by Mr. Shivambu on the scaring away of investors, I think the point needs to be clarified here. And that is that investors want to know what they're in for when they invest in a country. So they, if you uh, uh, say to them that, well, we are going to uh, expropriate wherever we feel like it, um, you know, you'll just have to take it or leave it. That is the one extreme. On the other extreme would be to present them with a very clear formulation, uh, legislative and administratively, of what can and cannot be done. Once you give them certainty, they are able to make a choice. But if they have no certainty, then you know that causes all kinds of problems in their minds to make a decision. So I, I hope I've clarified that issue. Uh, you Thank have. You, you have, uh, I just want to say that uh, this committee is aware of the distinction between the desired constitutional amendment and the legislative uh, challenges that government uh, is facing. And uh, they are aware that the relevant government departments are seized with uh, those, uh, those matters. So, uh, the fact that there are those matters that government is seized with should not, in the view or expressed by the members, uh, prevent making explicit what is uh, implicit. But uh, I think uh, 
you have expressed yourself uh, very well on these matters. And uh, let's leave it to the committee uh, when it uh, deliberates and uh, they will consider your submission on its merits and demerits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Advocate Ram Ramano. Advocate Ramano. Uh, Chair, Mr. the next presenter is from AgriSA. From? AgriSA. AgriSA. Uh, AgriSA, uh, the platform is yours. Morning, Chair, and good morning to everyone uh, present. Uh, myself uh, and my colleague will do a presentation. If you just give an opportunity to uh, load it onto the system. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, Christo van der Heere. I am the head of AgriSA, uh, executive director, being appointed in October last year. And then my fellow colleague, uh, Annelies, um, who will also do part of the presentation. Um, let me start right away. Okay. I hope, I trust that you can see it. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a brief outline. Uh, who is AgriSA? Background, the proposed amendment, what is the problem that needs to be addressed? And then obviously the big question uh, whether the constitutional amendment is the best way to address this problem. International law and best practice, and then advisory panel recommendations, economic and food security considerations, proposed solutions, and conclusion. Who is AgriSA? And I think most of you are aware that uh, we are a federation of agricultural organization, uh, been around the block uh, for many, many decades. Uh, our members include nine provincial organizations, 26 commodity organizations, that includes Grain SA, the wool growers, the red meat producers, macadamia nut producers, the wine producers, tobacco producers, the wildlife ranches, everyone a part of the commodity organizations. And then we have approximately 60 corporate members. And those are members that are active within the entire value chain of uh, the agricultural sector. And yes, we represent farmers regardless of gender, color, or creed. There's just a further breakdown. As you can see, approximately 28,000 farmers that are part of 1,000 farmer associations. And they are all part of uh, our provincial affiliations. And uh, there's also a breakdown of our commodity organizations, agronomy, animal production, and horticulture. And they've got subsectors underneath them. And there's the seven, 57 corporate members uh, from the input uh, producers and suppliers <clears throat> throughout the entire value chain, right up to uh, Woolworths that are a big player in terms of the retail market. So the background. We've been very, very active in the space of this debate, and we've used every opportunity to participate in the debate. We've also submitted comprehensive documents to the Constitutional Review Committee and present our views to the CRC and the Ad Hoc Committee. We have been engaging with various experts, and we've studied international human rights instruments insofar as they deal with property. Because, Chair, we are absolutely committed to building a growing and inclusive agriculture sector. And we want to see that new farmers, and especially black farmers, uh, are successful in the space. Uh, that commitment has been there, and we can share tremendous successful stories and exciting stories about the successes that we've achieved already in this space. Uh, the wool growers, we have 4,000 black farmers who are exporting wool to international markets. In the grain industry, approximately 10,000 grain, black uh, grain farmers who have uh, experienced tremendous growth in terms of yields and also supplying local markets, international markets with maize. And then a whole lot of other farmers, black farmers, especially that are part of other commodities such as citrus farmers, also uh, the deciduous farmers, and they are all either supplying to local markets or international markets. Yes, we've looked at international best practices regarding this very complex question of compensation. 
and um, you know what uh, needs to happen within that space. But also, we have been very honest in terms of what will be the likely consequences of expropriation without compensation in our sector and on in terms of food security. Now, Chair, we have been very, very uh, lucky last year. Good rains. We've seen uh, lots of exports happening. Agriculture, in fact, was the saving grace for South Africa during the lockdown period. Uh, on the uh, input side, we've seen on, on, in the supply side, uh, we are well stocked. Uh, on the demand side, due to uh, uh, unemployment, due to other factors, obviously people are still struggling. But the agricultural you. sector did not uh, sit still. We have embarked on food distribution campaigns. We have uh, embarked on drought uh, distribution or drought aid distribution campaigns to assist farmers and communities all over South Africa. And yes, uh, in view of all of these things that we are doing, we have uh, suggested also viable sustainable alternatives. We have co-hosted the Bella Bella Land Summit in August 2018, and many farmers uh, arrived there and they illustrate what they are doing with regards to land reform, farmer development and rural development. And we're also aware of the fact that politics have played a major role in this debate. But it's not politics that put food on the table. It's farmers, farm workers that are slogging it uh, out there in the field day and night, and who are facing all the risks that come with it that put food on the table. And so today, we are very clear that our stance, and especially South Africa's stance on the, in terms of the amendment of a fundamental human right, uh, and that uh, specifically now we talk about um, the fundamental human right in terms of ownership of property, that that should not be motivated or compromised by politics, but by the reality and the practicality of food security out there. If you look at this International Property Rights Index, you'll see that countries that are going out of the way, one, not only to protect property rights, but also to expand property rights. Those countries, their average per capita income sits at $57,000, and they are in the top 20%. And then you've got different quintiles. Um, it, uh, uh, the, the per capita income lowers uh, to the right of this graph, especially where countries do not respect or go out of the way to protect property rights. The next slide speaks to a very, very important, um, <clears throat> um, you know, the ranking in terms of where we sit in terms of this global index. Now, South Africa currently sits at 70 out of 129 countries. Now, what does that tell us? 70 out of 129 countries, that there's no deliberate effort by our country to expand property rights. Millions of black people in rural areas, especially in your former homelands. Uh, many uh, uh, black people that are living on church land and on other state land, if only we can expand property rights and give them ownership of that land, Chair, we can grow wealth in this country. I can share many stories, personal stories, in terms of how ownership of a property has given me access to wealth because I've been able to collateralize that property. I've been able to go to a bank with that collateralized property and get access to loans to and uh, assist my own kids to continue with their studies and so forth. My grandfather was an owner of property and through that ownership of that property, he left money for us as a family to enable us to continue our studies. Property rights and expansion of property rights will assist South African citizens, lifting them out of poverty and enable them to create wealth for themselves. That cannot be the preserve of the elite only chair. It must be expanded because all of us, as we sit here today, interacting with each other as politicians, as specialists in the field of agriculture, and as uh, people that present different organizations, all of us are experiencing the privilege of ownership on a daily basis. And that's how we create wealth. 
what we need to do is we need to find ways and means to expand property rights, protecting it, entrenching it so that the majority of our people can build wealth for themselves. This graph just refers to intellectual property rights, and there you'll see our ranking is a bit higher, and that's very good. But I mean, we can do much more to also protect intellectual property rights. My colleague now will continue in terms of uh, uh, the further uh, uh, explaining what needs to be done to uh, uh, ensure that we do not uh, compromise our constitution and in the same way compromise uh, the property rights of our people. Good morning, Chairperson, Honourable Members. I'm going to deal with the following three points and then I'm going to hand back to um, our Executive Director just to deal with some economic implications and to close off. So as far as the, the um, amendment um, and AGRI-SA stance on the amendment, Chair, are concerned, we are very clear and we've been clear all along um, that we are opposed to the amendment of Section 25. That does not mean, however, that we do not recognize the need for land reform and that we do not real, realize how critically important it is that we, we speed up land reform. But for us, it is also very important that whatever we do should be sustainable. It should not just be short-term thinking. It is very clear to us, Jay, in terms of all the research that we've done, in terms of the experience that our members have over many years in being involved in land reform, that the property clause is not the actual impediment to land reform. And that is one of the reasons why we say that there is no change needed um, of Section 25 of the Constitution to achieve just and equitable land reform. If we were to change the Constitution and to make provision for um, expropriation without compensation, that would be out of step with various internationally recognized standards, such as the so-called standard of equivalence in the carrying of public burdens, which basically says that you cannot expect an individual or a particular group to bear the full brunt of something that was done in the past and that now needs to be rectified, like we are doing with land. It is a, it's in the public interest and it is um, a burden that needs to be um, carried equally by the society as a whole. Then there's also the, the whole formula, which is an internationally recognized formula for compensation, which requires prompt, adequate, and effective compensation. And in our view, um, no compensation cannot be regarded as effective compensation. So in, if you look at the um, preamble to the bull chapters, and one of the assumptions there is that expropriation at no compensation will um, result in addressing the historic wrongs um, and will ensure equitable access to land. We are saying that that is not factually correct and it is actually not borne out by experience. Expropriation at no compensation will not solve this huge and very complex problem of land reform that we all want to solve, that, that we all realize that if we, we don't solve it, um, you know, it might get out of hand and all of us will suffer, suffer the consequences. But the point is that if you do an amendment like this, you are sending a particular signal into our economy. And that signal may lead to um, um, negative sentiments on the parts of investors and particularly foreign investors, but also local investors and even farmers investing back into their own properties. Um, and we feel that our country um, is, cannot, cannot um, afford that kind of negative sentiment. Um, so, the other point, Chair, that we want to make is that um, you, the, the, the various fundamental rights that are protected in the Bill of Rights. And if you change one of them, it might have an impact on some of the other fundamental rights. So we're just making the point that that should also be taken into consideration whether maybe there is an impact if we change Section 25 in this manner um, to uh, on, on some of the other um fundamental rights. So, Jefferson, I'm, I'm going to be brief here with the next slide because I think the points have been quite elegantly um, and adequately made by some of the previous presenters. But the real problem with land reform is not the constitution and it is not the requirement of compensation. And that has been stated by the high level panel report. There's a quote there, which I'm not going to read to you on the next slide, 
where they very clearly said the constitution and the requirement for compensation is not the problem. It is other things, such as the lack of implementation of the existing policies and programs, such as corruption, which has become a major problem, such as the small budget, um, the inadequate budget that has been reverted, uh, referred to already. Um, so those are the things, Jay, if we're serious about land reform, that needs to be addressed, not amending the constitution. Then on the next slide also, and um, you can read it in, in your own time, there's just, just some art articles that illustrate these points um, of corruption and the inadequacy of implementation and the Muelase case that has also been referred to by one of the previous presenters. Um, where the court said very clearly that, you know, the problem is that the, the department isn't um, in implementing its own policies and programs um, as it should. So the question then is, is, it, is the, the way forward um, an amendment to the constitution? Is that, is that the answer to, the, to this complex problem? And our view is that definitely it is not. Um, so um, we are saying this is a fundamental right. It's a very serious thing to amend fundamental rights. It may have all sorts of consequences foreseen and unforeseen because it's currently quite finely balanced. So we feel that that would not be the right way to go. Um, and in, in that respect, we support the findings by the high level panel on key legislation amongst others. So, gee, we, and I think our executive um, director has made the point quite clearly, we are very keen to create a joint vision for our rural areas going into the future. Um, because our members farm in the rural areas. If the rural areas are not stable, uh, if we don't um, make progress with land reform there, they will suffer the consequences. For, so for us, it's very important to solve this in a positive manner. And we believe that one of the main ways in which you can do this is through partnerships between the private sector and government. And there are quite um, positive um, developments at the moment in terms of financing, for example, the blended financing policy where government and private sector are now trying to work together to make financing affordable. So we believe that many of the solutions are already catered for in the framework of, for example, the National Development Plan, Operation Pakisa, and also various sec private sector plans, um, which we have um, made public and can once again make available to you if you are interested in seeing those. Um, uh, then just... uh, the presenter's got a, a minute left to round up. Okay, Chairperson, in that case, um, I'm not going to bore you with all the detail, although I think it's very important, the international perspective, because the Kusatu has made some points around international perspective that we definitely do not agree with. Um, there are international instruments, um, as well as best practices that have been written up by the United Nations on expropriation and compensation that we need to take um, account of, and that graph illustrates the different um, approaches in different countries that are followed, and none of them apply the principle of, of no compensation. So I'm going to skip right to the last slide. Um, we're going to then not have the time to share the economic consequences with you. We will do so in detail tomorrow when we present on the expropriation bill to the portfolio committee, but I'm just going to allow our um, executive director then to um, to wrap up on the concluding slide. No, uh, we, we allocated 15 minutes to agree SA. Now you are uh, allocating further minutes to your executive director. Is that <laughs> fair? Okay, Jay, no, that's fine. No, in the, on the original program, we understood that we had 30 minutes, but we, we, we abide no, by No, 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 it was 15 for presentation and 15 for questions of clarity. Uh, Mr. Van Reden, what else do you want to say? Uh, Chair, I think uh, all of the final statements is included in the uh, presentation, but I want to really uh, stress the point. We need to come together as a nation. We need to find a common solution, not one that is aimed at punishing people or destroying the economy, but one that is built on consensus, one that is incentivizing uh, these kind of partnerships. And the biggest challenge, Chair, is the issue of financing. We've seen the land bank in major, major financial distress. 
We've seen our fiscus in major financial distress. We cannot afford this country to go economically uh, in the wrong direction any further. We need to find a way, and this is where the agriculture sector has done quite a lot of good to build the economy, to ensure there's food on the table, but we need to find an alternative to uh, an amendment to the constitution. And I think the alternative is there, in, it's already in the plans. We are now writing a new master plan for agriculture. And I don't know whether Parliament is aware of that master plan. We have been active participants in the PAKISA process. We proposed many, many solutions, but our biggest setback was the departments that are not working together. There's such a fragmented approach to financing, to training, to uh, departments working together, to our marketing strategy, that uh, it, at the end of the day, it impacts negatively on the establishment of successful black farmers and uh, white farmers that are critical uh, in terms of uh, supplying this country with food, as well as our international markets. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this process, uh, this process is aimed at uh, ensuring that we all work together to find uh, a South African solution. But uh, you know, uh, the Honorable Premier of uh, KwaZulu-Natal, Honorable Sisha, uh, Skalala, said that thousands of unemployed youth and graduates uh, in agriculture want to enter this agricultural sector. Now, uh, would, you, would you be opposed in expanding access uh, to more black farmers through a constitutional amendment so that uh, we can answer the demand that was observed by Honorable Zgalala. Uh, but also you emphasize the question of uh, uh, rural areas. To the best of my knowledge, rural areas are former native reserves located in 13% of uh, the land. The remaining 87% is in the hands of a minority and the state. Do, do, do you think you can achieve a, a fair uh, situation without addressing access to the 87%? And uh, this question of international standards, uh, wouldn't you agree that, uh, you know, these international standards were actually set by colonial uh, countries before colonial peoples had a say in international affairs. And that's why even now uh, there's a demand for the restructuring of the Security Council of uh, the, 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 the UN. So uh, if you could, uh, when your opportunity comes to respond, if you can just touch on those uh, uh, issues. And your colleague talks about uh, changing one uh, fundamental rights having an impact on others. I wonder whether she's aware that uh, like the sunset clauses, some of these things were put in the confidence as confidence building mechanism to allow the negotiated settlements uh, to un unfold. But uh, let me not take uh, the time of the honorable members and uh, I want to uh, give them an opportunity to express themselves. Uh, I see honorable Dr. Ndozi. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. <clears throat> well, I wanted to ask uh, a rather pointed questions. One is, do your members acknowledge that they have been beneficiaries of a crime against humanity in that uh, as holders of the land, whether it be from generation to generation or the fact that they have bought what could on the basis of this being a stolen property uh, uh, coming out of a crime against humanity. That's number one. Number two, um, isn't it dishonest that uh, uh, you say that property ownership is uh, significant or rather important to economic development like private ownership of the land as if non-private ownership of the land 
is incompatible with economic growth. Do you know that in China and Vietnam, which are some of the best performing economies in the world for the past 30 years, there's literally no private ownership of the land. There's no investor that has left. There's no agricultural program that has stopped. Uh, but because of the histories of these countries uh, in relation to the fact that they were colonized or they were dispossessed, they took a resolution that they will never again be private ownership of the land. People will only have land use rights. And those economies work as perfectly as Europe. And in fact, in some instances, far much better than economic economies in, the, in Europe. And then the last one, would you have a problem if um, land that is not used by a farmer at the moment is expropriated to achieve the equality caused by an historic injustice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. Any other hand? Any other hand? Uh, Mr. Handriede, can you respond? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to respond. I think I want to start with uh, uh, the Honorable Doctor's uh, comments about crime against uh, humanity. And what I want to emphasize is that farmers at this point in time are producing food on a large scale. Farmers and the farming sector earns um, foreign exchange for this country. We've seen exports and imports uh, that sustained this country and the international work for a large part of last year and also uh, this year. In addition to that, uh, there's job creation on a massive scale, 800,000 jobs per annum. And that's only in the primary agriculture sector. And if I want to, uh, if you look at the secondary sector, the processing side, massive job creation. We cannot, we cannot deny what has happened in the past. But is we need to have a very, very uh, holistic approach to addressing the social justice of the past. One, and that is to ensure that we produce food, affordable food, quality food. If you look at our ranking on the international index, all of these things are done by farmers. And the bigger question ultimately is obviously how do we then work together with government to, as you rightly said, address the social justices in, uh, uh, injustices of the past, but at the same time, making sure that we continue to do what we're supposed to do in terms of section 27 of the constitution that requires that people must have access to food, water, and things like that. Then in terms of the Chinese experiences that you've uh, related to, I think we need to differentiate between the context, the Chinese context, the South African context. We need to understand what is being done on behalf of the Chinese government to ensure that there is uncertainty, and that certainty brings about greater investment. We've seen in China over the past a couple of years, they've moved away from uh, 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 trying to uh, uh, position government as instrumental in terms of economic development. They forge partnerships. We've seen massive investment, even by South African companies, forging partnerships with Chinese companies to bring about greater, greater investment in the Chinese economy. And that was of, certainly of great benefit to the South African economy. So it's all about how do you make sure that there's certainty around these type of things. And last but not least, expropriation of land that is not used. I think there's a fundamental difference just to confiscate land without following due processes. And uh, we must make sure that expropriation in South Africa does not at the end of the day end up in confiscation and arbitrarily confiscation of land without paying due consideration to constitutional processes. Chairperson, if, if I might just come in on a few of the points that um, mm -hmm. not touched on. So the one is your remark on the rural areas. I mean, um, our definition of rural areas is broadly anything that's not urban. 
that's not a town or a city. So that does not in just include the old homelands, but it's a broader concept. That's what we meant by that. Your remark on the 70, uh, 87, 13 percent, I mean, that figure was the correct figure in 1994, but a lot has changed since then. Um, so a lot of land has been transferred, but was state land. Um, is now in the hands of the current government. Apart from that, we've had the land reform in, um, program in terms of which um, I think around 10% of the land has now been transferred. And then um, the land which um, there's a dispute about because AgriSA had our own land audit done and there's a, a government land audit, but how, of how much land has actually changed hands um, with, without the state being involved in that. Um, and you also have to take into consideration what kind of land are we talking about. So in our land audit, we looked at various factors. Um, for example, you know, um, how productive is that land? Put a value to um, if, it's, if it's highly productive land or not. And um, even if you just look at the, the figure um, of the amount of hectares, um, in our estimation, it's around 27% of agricultural land that's already been transferred. But so there's, so there's a whole debate about that, but it's definitely not 87, 13% anymore. And, and I think we should never be understood to be saying that we are against land reform. It's how it is done and what the consequences are of, of how it is done that, that we have an argument um, with. And then as far as the international standards are concerned, um, Chair, those, and if you just look at that one slide that I didn't get to talk about where we've got the different graphs, um, you'll see there are a lot of African countries mentioned there that have got standards of compensation. So it's definitely not just a thing that was drawn up by the colonial powers. It's just also not a single standard. There are a number of standards and they weren't all created at the same time. Um, so, so I, I, I don't think that that, um, you know, that that we should be saying it's colonial powers that have created these standards. And then um, just also a point on, oh, a very important point, I think, is my understanding as a constitutional lawyer has always been that our constitution is underpinned by the concept of restorative justice. There was never any intention to punish anybody for what, what happened in the past. Um, and and um, that is also why we're saying that the, the cost of land reform is something that needs to be borne by all of us equally as a society and not by certain individuals that then, then gets punished um, for, for our past. And then just the very last point on the unused land. I mean, very difficult concept. What is unused land? Who gets to decide what, what is unused and that it now all of a sudden has no, no value? <coughs> Chair, then very quickly, you talked about unemployed youth. Uh, we absolutely share your concerns regards unemployed youth. We have, and if we want to give you a breakdown, if I can, may allow it, we sit with 5,500 farms that are currently in the hands of the state. The president has mentioned those farms in his uh, State of the Nation address. I've visited some of those farms. I was shocked to see the state of the lapidation on those farms. Secondly, we have the Agricita, which collects approximately 500 million rand per annum from your current crop of commercial farmers. That money must be utilized to train these young people in, uh, uh, in the art of agriculture. Secondly, we've got uh, almost 500 million rand that is also collected through statutory levies uh, that is also being paid by the sector. That money sits with the National Agricultural Marketing Council. And then we've got the budget of uh, the Department of Agricultural, um, uh, Department of Agricultural Forestry, Forestry and Fisheries, together with land reform, a massive budget. Now, the bigger question is, how do we then bring all of those budgets together with that of uh, the private sector into one pot so that we create more opportunities for young people, not only on those 5,500 farms, but also uh, in terms of our existing crop of commercial farms. But in addition to that, how do we bring that youth into create, creation of infrastructure? You know that you cannot farm without water, but we are sitting with serious challenges in terms of water supply. We sit with serious challenges in terms of uh, finances. We sit with serious challenges in terms of training. 
And that's why I say we need to be much more creative in terms of opening up opportunities for our youth. At our institution at AgriSA, we've got young black uh, 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 students that have completed their agricultural degrees, they work for us, and we are opening opportunities for them to become permanent employees of agriculture. And that's the way to go, building these capacities from the grassroots level upwards, but at the same time ensuring that all of our institutions make a collective effort to address the issue of youth unemployment in South Africa. But Chair, we cannot continue with the situation where farms that have been transferred to communities or individuals uh, um, uh, runs into serious financial trouble due to all kinds of other factors because a farm that goes out of production contributes to food insecurity and to unemployment. And also in terms of the contribution that we can make to pay ESCOM its electricity bills and to the municipalities to pay their rates and taxes. Uh, Mr. Van Rede and your colleague, thank you very much. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the relevant departments have been invited to come and uh, account before us. But uh, I think that the honorable members will bear in mind what we have raised. For instance, that uh, there are budgets that uh, are available in the agri statutory marketing council, the Department of Land Affairs. We will ask them to explain why these budgets are not being utilized whilst the youth are waiting there uh, to participate uh, in this sector. And I think honorable members will agree with uh, your colleague that uh, the process we are embarking on is not meant to punish anybody, but to address historic injustices. So there's a difference between uh, punishment of people and uh, addressing historical injustices. So I don't see any other hands and I want to thank you for your input. I hope that uh, you will uh, also finish us with uh, this uh, input and further comments that we have made so that uh, the committee can be empowered uh, to consider your proposals on their merits and demerits. Uh, uh, advocate, hello? Mr. Farianen, are you saying something? No, no, I'm just saying thank you to everyone for giving us the opportunity to share also our views. Thank you very much. Uh, Advocate uh, Romano? Yes, Advocate. Chair, Chair, the next presenters will be the Black Management Forum. I don't know if they're all here, but I see that Dr. Vilakazi and Mr. Keza Koza are, yeah, are here, so maybe they can start. Okay, thank you, Advocate. Uh, Mr. Villagazi and Mr. Koza, who comes first? Mr. Villagazi. Thank you so much, Chair. We've got, uh, it's Dr. Villagazi, Chair. Oh, and Dr. thank you so Villagazi. much. Um, I think yeah, we've welcome. got I've our, been, mm. yes, we've no, I was just worried that we are dominated by men. Now I see the second <laughs> woman. Um, so that's very encouraging. <clears throat> Isn't always the case, eh? We, we have to uh, uh, penetrate. We, we, must combat, we must combat that <laughs> domination. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, with me, I've got my um, deputy president of the BMF. I think she just wants to do the introduction first. I don't know if she's already on the line. She doesn't seem to be there. Proceed. We will allow her to come in when she arrives. Okay. No, that's great. Uh, no, thank you so much um, uh, to the committee for this for extending this invite to us as the BMF. Um, my role today was, is meant to be just to take you through the views um, shared by the BMF members. Um, on this very important issue. We are quite, most of the time, we tend to be very emotional about it because it's that important um, to us, very close to our hearts. Um, so maybe before I will share what this view is, 
Um, I'll start by talking about the, 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 the PMF, um, what we stand for, um, why we exist, uh, which is largely that we exist for, to drive social economic tra transformation. Um, and we do that by obsessing about justice, social, uh, social justice and fairness um, in, in, in our society. Um, but mostly we also focus then on, on driving managerial development. So our members are typically managers um, in South Africa and also in the public sector. So we are a non-racial um, organization. We welcome everyone, but largely our members are black managers. Um, I guess because we call ourselves Black Management Forum, possibly. Um, um, but yeah, we do attract black, black managers. So how we normally work to come up with views that we take them forward is that we then source um, uh, views from the membership. Uh, we, we run workshops whenever there's a, there's a the point of view that we need to put forward. We run workshops to our members to come up with a view that resonates um, largely with the, our membership. So what we are presenting today is it's, it's aspirations um, of our members, which is um, black managers um, in corporate South Africa across industries. So it, it, this, it, these are people who may or may not understand the intricacies of, of land issues, but they know what they feel and what they aspire for, which is largely that um, land must come back to the, to the, to the owners of those that were, were uh, dispossessed of that land. So the position is very clear on that. Um, and what we are uh, saying today is that because land is a, is a, a, a the message of the camera. I'm struggling with my network a bit. So we are saying that ownership of land is a, is a fundamental economic currency. Um, that will always be highly contested um, in this country. And we can never take that for granted. Um, and the reason why we need uh, uh, the constitution to be quite clear and ambiguous is, is, is for that reason, um, that the constitution of this country needs to help us because at the moment, um, we believe that the, some of the reasons why we haven't achieved um, what the majority of, this, of the country aspires for is that the constitution is not as clear. Um, so, and, and we see that in the pace of, of land reform, uh, 26 years later, we are still sitting with serious problems in this country, problems that have denied um, justice to the people of South Africa, majority of those people. So, and, and, and as the BMF, we've been on this path um, of, of, of being involved in, in conversations and debates about the, um, uh, the land issue on the land issue. For instance, in 2016, we submitted a position uh, towards land reform where we were arguing that um, we are opposed to the idea of land ownership being custodians of, of, of state. And the idea that land use licenses to, uh, must be granted when there's a purpose for the land. So we are very clear on that, that the people who lost land in this country were individuals. It wasn't the state, the state um, took land by force um, from people, ordinary black people, and therefore the land needs to be brought back to ordinary land, um, uh, ordinary black people in this country. Um, so, um, and, and uh, understanding that government has the obligation, the constitutional obligation to allow equitable access to land to people who suffer dispositions through, through this violence um, and legislation under colonial rule and apartheid. So government needs to take upon that obligation and fulfill it. Um, and, and, and while we are arguing for that, um, the obligation should be um, comp no compensation. We, we are really against um, uh, the, the, the idea of compensating for land that was taken away from people. Um, but we are also mindful that we, we don't want to see a situation where there's impact on production um, and, uh, and the economy. This, uh, some of the, the previous speak speakers have also argued that we are not for a situation where we find ourselves um, in a position where we damage uh, uh, our agricultural sector, for instance. We're not arguing for such things. We're saying let's take considerations to ensure that there are no damages to our economy and, uh, and, and food production. 
Um, and we are quite thankful that this position has been expressed by majority of the of the people of this country and it, a motion was taken in, 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 in parliament, two third majority um, took a resolution to amend the constitution um, to reflect the idea of expropriation without compensation. And that resolution was very clear. It was not ambiguous at all. Um, and to ensure that land is returned to those uh, from whom it was taken under colonialism and apartheid, very clear resolution was taken by two third majority. Um, and now here we are having a bill that moves away from that clear resolution. Um, and as BMF, we are, we are saying that there are gaps in this bill. Um, as, as it stands, it's, it reflects largely the current framework um, that, is, it, that is being used in the constitution. And we are saying that it, that it needs to be, um, we need more clarity. Um, so we need more certainty um, essentially uh, provided uh, to lawmakers. Um, so, and uh, we've seen it, as I've said already, um, there's proof that in, under the current framework of section 25, we have not seen the results that we um, aspired for. Um, and therefore uh, it has to change. Like there's no, there's no questioning about it. And, 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 and I sympathize with some of the previous speakers who are saying that um, there's no need for, 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 for the constitution to be changed. Um, uh, but we believe as the BMF that there is the need in order for, for clarity to be obtained. We need uh, succinct um, laws that uh, enable us um, to understand what, um, uh, every, what it means. We don't want to be arguing in courts and, uh, and uh, people, ordinary people of this country ending up losing just simply because they don't understand the law. So it has to be as clear as it can be. Um, and how that can be done. So our, our, our uh, re uh, uh, resolution is that um, let's, let's stay closely to what the, the, the resolution is saying. Um, it doesn't say anything about circumstances or situations where compensation is applicable. However, the bill now suddenly introduces circumstances. We don't want that. The resolution is clear and it does not uh, uh, abdicate responsibility to, uh, to compensation to the courts um, as the bill suddenly is, is introducing now that the courts uh, will be the arbiters um, um, uh, you know, of, of, of these issues in these, in these issues. So we are saying that we don't want that. We don't want a, a clear, clear, clear um, uh, 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 writing um, to enable all members of society to understand what is happening. And then also giving um, decision power, all the powers to the ministers. We are arguing that uh, maybe it's time that we protect our ministers as well. Um, and not give them so much power. And uh, we see that even to, to this day, we are sitting uh, in the Zondo Commission and with cases of corruption. Uh, previous speakers have also cited some of those that these are some of the reasons why we haven't been able to achieve the desired outcomes we want because of corruption. So we can um, manage that by not giving minister, ministers so much power. And the time frame that is, is, is mentioned in the resolution is very clear. This is land that was taken away from people um, and that, that land must be brought back. Um, you know, um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not um, um, confusing the situation to say which land should be brought back or which land should be retained. Uh, and, and, and how about people who've already uh, 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 invested so much in some of these land uh, it's very clear the land that was taken must come back, must be returned. And our proposal is that we include a, a social obligation clause in the constitution so that we affirm the rights of the landless people who openly occupy unused land for basic livelihood um, uh, purposes. For instance, have a legal protection for them. Um, and um, to acquire land, we are also proposing that uh, there may be processes, two-pronged pro 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 processes of doing that. So prioritize land meet, meeting certain criteria that has been identified by government. Um, it can be a, a, a identified and then those owners, um, they can be inv in, in, invited to willingly 
um, participate in, in retaining um, that land. So, um, and then once the planning uh, uh, committee has identified specific land for, it, for redistribution, uh, we make a, pub, a public call can be made to invite offers of the settlement from land owners. Only in cases where there is, we can't meet each other, uh, then the, the, the government um, can then um, have enter into robust negotiations with those owners to release the land. So this is our um, our stance as the BMF. We've got some, you will see in the submissions, we've got some amendments to um, the wording to help us um, and, uh, uh, achieve this. But just to conclude because of time, we believe very strong, strongly that we need to make these amendments. Um, they are critical and necessary to help us achieve the just and, and, and equal constitutional Democratic, democratic rainbow nation that we also desire. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Villagazi. Is your colleague here? Dr. Villagazi, is your colleague Tasnim? here? Are you here, Tasnim? Uh, I think uh, you have made uh, your submission very well. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think the balance of uh, evidence uh, supports uh, the need for legal certainty as you also do. And I uh, can assure you that uh, these honorable members in parliament cannot be, will not be reckless in handling uh, this matter. But uh, some, there are some fears that uh, amending the constitution uh, will affect food, food security, will affect the agricultural sector. But those who take that view do not uh, explain in what way that will uh, happen. And uh, similarly, you didn't uh, do it, but perhaps when you come to respond, uh, you will uh, throw some light on that because that's important to assist this committee to move forward. Uh, and now I will uh, take hands. Uh, I say, Honorable Masipa. Honorable Masipa. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks to the BMF presenter, Dr. Villagas. Villa. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just want clarity, uh, Dr. Villagasi. You did indicate that you will prefer minister is not given powers, uh, and obviously fearing the happenings at the Zondo Commission that the ministers might also, you know, get themselves, you know, caught into this kind of issues. So, in terms of your advice to this committee. How do you want us to go about in terms of uh, uh, making this, uh, you know, uh, legislation? And I know that you will be making probably a presentation to the expropriation bill, which I think I would suggest that you make it very, very clear. Uh, but I would really uh, like that you perhaps just advise us on this one as to who must be given the powers. And you talk about social obligation plan. And AgriSA was very clear that, you know what, at the end of the day, you need investment. You need to have an investment plan in order for you to have a social obligation. Uh, how do you see this amendment, you know, meaning expropriating the land without compensation and also still being able attract investment to contribute to this particular, you know, social obligation. Because social obligation does not just come, it comes through investment. And we are seeing at the moment that, uh, you know, the world over, the challenge is big with regards to fiscus. And uh, obviously, you know, I would really like you to help us. BMF play an important role in terms of assist managers and ensuring that they get jobs. Uh, but at the unemployment rate that is at uh, just low 40%, I think we definitely need to be clear when we 
are making the law as lawmakers to ensure that you know we don't really create more unemployment. State we are building this economy robustly going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hand. I don't see any other hand. I think, uh, Dr. Villagase, you were very clear. Uh, uh, Advocate uh, Ramano, uh, where are we now? Sir, I think they have not yet responded. So I can hear yeah, you. Gonna... So I'm saying the Black Management Forum should uh, provide us with responses to the questions. Okay. Uh, Dr. Villegas, can you? Okay, thank yeah, Chair. thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair. So as, as BMF, and yes, we will uh, submit to the expropriation bill as well um, to talk about all the mechanisms um, that we feel um, should be uh, followed um, in practice. However, the, the, the view is that instead of giving all the powers to a minister, rather have a separate um, committee uh, that will be made up of uh, various stakeholders um, 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 in, in society. The minister may be one, but the minister should not have the final say. Um, the views must be um, uh, canvassed um, by that committee that will be representing, and mainly ordinary uh, uh, people on the ground must also be represented um, and using ordinary language when you're talking about these matters. Um, you know, obviously professionals um, become part of that. That's the broader view of what needs to be happening. Uh, and then on the social obligation and attracting investments, um, as BMF, we feel very strongly that at some point as a country, um, and as professionals um, who, um, uh, you know, have aspirations for managing their own country, we need to start focusing more on also, what, what do our people need? As much as invest, investors um, every now and then get concerned about certain things, what is very clear is that investors are more concerned about uncertainty rather than um, a clear view where a people decide that they want to manage their affairs in the best way that moves their people forward. We cannot afford that 26 years into this country, we still have the high employment, unemployment rates, for instance, uh, partly because of these issues of tiptoeing, um, you know, not being uh, concerned about what, what do our people really need? Uh, and then investors can be lobbied um, behind the views that benefits the majority of our people. We can't look at investors as a starting point that we are always concerned that they may be worried and they, they may, we may lose jobs in the end. We've seen that it doesn't necessarily happen. We, at some point, we're very concerned about being downgraded. Um, and the impact of that. We've been downgraded as a country and what has been the impact. So uh, we need to really focus on, on, on what do our people need? What, what are the aspirations of the ordinary person on the ground? And right now the aspirations is that land must be returned land without compensation. The nil that has been included um, is not good enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vilagazi. I think uh, you have addressed uh, you are point eloquently and let's leave the matters in the hands of capable hands of this committee when it comes to deliberate on the matters. Uh, a person? Yes. Who yes, is that? Uh, uh, it's Kaiser Koza from the BMF. Um, I just wanted to add on your question, Chairperson, and honorable members on the issue of food security. Uh, because we've seen that that becomes a scarce crowd, that uh, people throw the issue of food security. Um, you know, I grew up in the Free State. Uh, I'm surrounded by farms. I'm in a small place called Harrismith in Tabazu. Every time I drive on the N3 or on the N5, around 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning, it is Black and African people that are tilling the soil. I have seen a number of white farmers who own four to five farms, but they have left the so-called Isindona to take care of those farms. So it is a misnomer to say when black people start owning these farms, we're going to have issues of food security in the country. As we speak, it is black people that are running those farms. 
Yes, there could be a question of how do we make sure that we empower people in terms of management and administration, uh, how to order the menu, how to deal with different meals, that we can twin them with a number of Africans and other people who are willing to assist these Africans who have studied BSc agriculture and the likes to make sure that these farms are managed correctly. And Chair, our emphasis is when we go for this, it must be done like it has been done in other countries on the use it or lose it principle. So if you are not able to till the land, you lose it because this land you are not giving it for you to just sit for it to idle, but you are giving this land so that it becomes productive. So that's our emphasis, Chair. So whoever, you know, we've heard this a lot in the media about issues of food security. We just want to assure people that with the principle of use it or lose it, we are going to make sure that those who are given this land use it optimally for the benefit of South Africa and not just for their benefit alone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kozam. Thank you for that uh, empirical evidence. Uh, please uh, put that to us in writing. And if there are more examples, please incorporate them. Uh, but uh, also, I guess we will need an audit of black experts who have no access uh, to land so that we can bring them on board. And lastly, I think uh, some capacitation uh, will also be required. And that's why there was a reference by Mr. Riede of uh, the budgets that uh, remain unutilized, that could be utilized to capacitate uh, the new entrants into the sector. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Advocate Ramano. I chair, there's still a hand from Dr. Milda there. Dr. Milda. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I, I heard what Mr. Corsa just now said. I didn't hear anybody say that black farmers will cause food insecurity. I think you are talking about expropriation without compensation. That's something else. The question I would like to ask is the, of Dr. Vilikazi. She just now referred to the downgrading. I, I couldn't hear her answer. Could she please just repeat the answer or a reply when she talks about the, the implications of downgrading, please? Thank you. Dr. Vilikazi. Dr. So, no, the, yes, no, the point I was making there is that we made a, a, a big hoo-ha around um, what, what the possible implications of being downgraded um, as a country. Um, and those implications would be dire. Um, there was a scare uh, uh, that was all over the, the, the media about that. Um, and uh, here we are right now being downgraded we haven't seen investors uh, really uh, taking out their money out of the country um, and, and, and moving out. We haven't seen it in the scale that it was um, uh, uh, communicated to be. Um, so it's this, these issues, we are, we are saying that it's similar to that, that we need to really focus on what is important to our people in this country and then um, uh, be in a position to argue our points with investors um, to get behind what's important to us. It can't be the other way around, that we are always concerned about what the investors will, will think and they will say and they will run away. Uh, we've seen that they, don't, they do not run away as much as we tend to fear that they would. Thank you. Uh, we also heard that in uh, the People's Republic of China and Vietnam, investors did not run away because uh, the land is uh, owned by the state. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, uh, Advocate Ramano. That was the last president for the day. The last presentation. The last presentation. So there are no other yes. presentations? No, okay. not, not today. OK, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Melda, I guess you have been answered. Dr. Melda. Yes, Chairperson, are you talking about the previous answer? Uh, yeah, the what the, the, you put a question. I just want to be sure that uh, you have been answered. I did so receive, that... Yes, Chairperson, I did receive an answer, but that's not the correct answer. Thank you. Okay, now that we can engage with uh, later. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, thank you for raising uh, your question. Uh, 
Uh, honorable members, uh, I think that uh, you will agree that uh, you have been afforded uh, enough time to ask questions for clarity and the answers that have been given will uh, assist uh, you when you consider all the submissions on their merits and demerits in our own uh, uh, meeting. And uh, I want to thank you honorable members for having unanimously agreed that uh, we should allow uh, the submitters who have made the requests uh, to appear before us uh, to indeed appear and be afforded in enough time to address us and also to take uh, questions uh, uh, on uh, for clarity. And thank you, honorable members, for being very reasonable and ensuring that uh, public meaningful public participation takes place. Thank you very much. And uh, I think unless there is an announcement, Advocate Ramano, I want to adjourn this meeting. Advocate Ramano? Advocate Ramano? No, he's, uh, he's not there, but uh, as usual, if there are any changes, uh, you will be duly informed by, by but by, for, for now, there is no uh, a change to our program. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair.